As a Marine, I used to have the graveyard patrol shift at the Beirut Bombing Memorial. Part of the memorial is dedicated to a veteran cemetery. Oddly enough, I never got freaked out being completely alone in a remote cemetery in the middle of the night, surrounded by dense woods on all sides. To be honest, it was actually kind of peaceful. However, one night I was patrolling near the perimeter fence, where some of the oldest headstones are, when I heard the sound of a woman humming. I followed the sound and noticed a light glowing through the vines and brush of a large tree. As I approached, I could literally feel my hair beginning to lift, as if there was an electric current in the air. I pushed aside the brush and what I saw nearly took my breath away. It was an old, weathered headstone with a large cross etched into the marble. Only the cross was glowing a bright, vivid blue, like a neon bulb. The humming was also suddenly much louder and had a weird plurality to it, like it was coming from hundreds of voices at once. Needless to say, I freaked out. I screamed like a scared little girl and sprinted back to the parking lot. I radioed the guard who was supposed to relieve me and forced him to come early, then spent the rest of my shift in the cab of his truck. I don't think he believed me, but he stayed in his truck and didn't go out on patrol until the sun was fully up. A few days later, I worked up the nerve to return to the grave, during the day, of course. As I suspected, in the light of day, it was a completely mundane headstone. There was no name, only the aforementioned cross. I ran my hands over the stone and checked to see if maybe there was some sort of hidden light source or solar panel, but no, it was just plain, solid, unremarkable stone. The humming was gone, too. I eventually returned to my normal shift, but never again experienced anything out of the ordinary. I never learned whose grave that was, either, but I find myself thinking about it from time to time. It certainly sounds absurd when I say it out loud, and I suppose it could have been a hallucination or a trick of my tired brain, but I don't believe it was. I think it was real, a ghost or spirit of some sort, but I don't think it was malevolent at all. I was by myself in the engine room of a submarine on the mid-watch, just a newly reported sailor trying to find equipment so I could display knowledge to one of the watch standers. There are a number of bays in the engine room lower level with narrow passages that pass through the center. I came down one of the ladders, and I swore I saw someone walking across the ship about 15 feet in front of me. I could hear his footsteps as he walked around a corner and out of sight. Three problems one. He was wearing utility, an older light blue blouse, and dark navy slacks. Nobody has utilities anymore. They had been phased out three years earlier. Two. There was only one other person awake in the engine room that late at night, and he was standing at the top of the ladder behind me, waiting for me to come back up with an answer to his question. Three. He wasn't actually there. I wrote it off as sleep deprivation, but I'll admit it shook me for a while. Fast forward to four months later, when I went out to sea with another submarine of the same type. While I was there, I met a sailor who had previously served on my ship. After a few weeks of standing watch with him, he told me a story of a sailor who had committed suicide while on watch when he served on my ship almost a decade earlier. In the engine room, lower level. In his service he wish I could have gotten a picture of the look on my face. I'm sure it was the definition of disbelief. This is my dad's story. After he was done in Vietnam, he was soon stationed at an Air Force base in Greenland. They had bad blizzards often there, and when they came through, the base shut down and every section of the barracks would take roll call. These blizzards are intense. There were cables running between all the buildings, you were attached to your person with a carabiner, so if there was a sudden whiteout, you didn't get lost and die. They had people die literally 20 meters from the shelter because they got lost in bad weather and froze. He said for about 5 months, every time they locked down for the weather, they would hear horrendous screaming outside. Everyone was accounted for, so they didn't risk sending anyone out to investigate. They wrote it off as an animal. However, 
Every time this was heard, the engine room would be wrecked. Tools were strewn across the floor, tables and toolboxes were knocked over, and a several thousand pound jet engine was lifted from its workbench crane and smashed nearly 30 feet away. The hangars and engine room had cameras covering every single possible entrance with spotlights that made them clear even in a wide out. No animals, no people, no anything was ever seen entering or leaving those buildings. Then one day, it just stopped. Edit, okay, since I have a lot of debate on what could have caused this, I will clear some stuff up. This was not something they just shrugged at. It cost a lot of money and threw a wrench in at least one surveillance routine, which caused a lot of brass from the DOD and the CIA to breath fire down the base commander's neck. This facility, beyond military function, served as a base for a lot of civilian research as well. There was a full investigation using all manner of scientists, engineers, and specialists. They came up with no satisfactory explanation for what was happening. I do not believe in the paranormal, nor did my father. This is the only spooky type story he has from 22 years in the service. No one knows what happened. It was very strange in every way. Hundreds of people wrote reports and documented this, it wasn't just some grease monkeys scratching their heads and randomly guessing. That said, I spoke to my mom. She told me a couple of things I missed. On one of these occasions, the U-2 in the shop had all its electronics turned on. Many of the systems in this plane were specially built for this airframe and this particular cruise mission. These systems were complex and archaic. Very few people knew how to operate this machinery, and the only ones on base that could were two engineers and its crew. It wasn't a simple matter of hitting power buttons and flipping switches from off to on. Another time, Three barrels of hydraulic fluid vanished and were never found. They doubted the screaming noise was wind because it came in short, irregular bursts and the winds never produced those sounds again. They theorized it was a polar bear but, if it was, its coincidental timing was extremely uncanny. Lastly, Control picked up a bunch of weird interference and anomalous readings that, again, had the uncanny timing of happening only when this was going on. They were never able to reproduce these errors in a controlled manner. Edit 2, okay, since I am still getting a stream of people saying I believe this was something supernatural or aliens or something. Now, what I am saying is that the best possible explanation is that a series of many unrelated, unlikely, and unreproducible events came together in an also unlikely manner that left no satisfactory explanation for what was going on. The screaming was thought to be from a polar bear or something. The radar glitches were thought to be due to moisture but left no obvious signs. The barrels were most likely the result of an inventory error. Etc, etc, etc however, even with this all in mind, the chances of all these events coming together in this manner, by sheer coincidence, are astronomical. So no one was willing to say anything with certainty, thus no satisfactory answer and writing it off as an act of God. It's creepy, it's bizarre, but it's not supernatural, and the answer isn't simply it's the wind. For more info, see my replies to others about the construction of the place, the cameras, etc. My dad's stories he served in the Taiwanese Marines as a drill sergeant. Much of the ground in Taiwan saw violence under occupation, and it was rumored that his base was built on or near a mass grave. Needless to say, he's had a few paranormal stories. He had a guy report to him in the morning, exhausted but frazzled. The night before, he had been on guard duty, overlooking the firing range. The targets on the range were a mix of clay and wood figures, cut and drawn to look like an enemy soldier aiming a rifle at you. According to the guard, when he'd been bored out of his mind staring out over the range, he saw clearly as day one of the clay soldiers wearily lay down his rifle and exclaimed damn, I'm tired, the guard said he passed out from fright. During the evening, when training was over, the sergeants, for the most part, had the time to themselves. My dad liked to go snake hunting at dusk, 
when the heat was rising from the ground and the snakes came out of their holes. So one evening, he sets out, carrying a bag, a nice long stick, and a flashlight. As he was making his way across the field, zigzagging in a search pattern, he found himself getting closer and closer to an old, decrepit outhouse that had been abandoned as it was too far from the main base. As he got within a few yards of it, he was hit with a sudden feeling of apprehension. Something told him going near the outhouse was a bad idea. At that moment, his flashlight, aimed right at the construct, went out. He fiddled with the battery, smacked it, thought, damn, better get a new battery, and turned around to head back. The moment he turned and faced the main base, the flashlight flickered back on. Great, time to keep hunting. The moment he turned to face the outhouse, it flickered off again. Faced with the base, it flickered on. He did this two or three times, got the message, verbally apologized for intruding, turned and walked calmly back to base. The base itself was surrounded by forest and mountains, the natural terrain of Taiwan. One day, a soldier was reported missing, as the day went on, it was clear that he'd either deserted or was in serious trouble. A manhunt-slash-rescue team was organized and most of the base was out searching for the guy as the rain started to come in. As night fell, they called it off, and got ready to try again tomorrow. They found him in the morning, huddled in a wet, dark cave, scared, speechless and out of his mind. No one was sure what he saw to cause him to freak out, and they never found out, they shipped the guy out soon afterwards. Finally, during one of his years on the base, it was hit by a huge typhoon. Typhoons are pretty regular in Taiwan, especially during the summer, but this one was going to set records. Everyone hunkered down and reinforced the base as best they could, and it held well. After days of relentless rain and wind, they emerged to survey the damage. One of the trees on the base had been hundreds of years old, it sat on a hill and overlooked the base, and so had been the site of a Buddhist shrine set at its roots. The roots twisted and turned into the air, the storm had torn the tree from the ground. And yet, the shrine itself was untouched, even the red silk covering, with nothing weighing it down, hadn't moved an inch despite the winds that had finally torn the great tree from its hill after hundreds of years. The soldiers took this as a sign that, despite whatever might be thrown against them, their spirit would remain strong and unmoved. I was working the night shift in an old military complex that was originally built back in the 50s. I was starting to feel sleepy, so I went for a walk to wake myself up and ended up getting lost in the maze of underground tunnels, finding myself in a part of the complex that obviously hadn't been used in decades. Everything looked like it was just left there and forgotten one day, eerily frozen in time. I was extremely tired and stressed out from work, and that really didn't help me to be able to rationally retrace my steps. Everything around me seemed like something was hiding in the shadows and watching me. It took a long time, but I finally made it back to my position and didn't tell anyone what happened. Luckily, it was the night shift and no one noticed I was gone. A year later, we got a new guy, and in the middle of the night shift, he got up and went for a walk. A couple of hours later, he came back looking like he'd seen a ghost. I just gave him a knowing nod, and he knew I knew exactly what he had just gone through. Navy. When I was in Groton, Connecticut, for basic enlisted submarine school, I was roving the barracks at night. I had a UI, under instruction, so I was showing him the ropes. What to check and how to check. It was mainly fire extinguishers and secured doors. On the second or third floor of the barracks, there is a recreation room with a TV, chairs, and a piano. Mind you, Everyone was asleep and it was 2 in the morning. Well, I decided to go and see if I remembered how to play the piano a little. We decided to continue to finish the patrol, so we started walking down the hall when we heard a single piano note go off. We both heard it while I was in mid-conversation, so we kind of looked back, and then we both looked at each other to see if we both had heard the same noise. 
We shrugged it off as our imaginations running wild. But as soon as we got to the end of the hall and opened the door to the stairway, a sharp key note was heard coming from down the hall in the direction of the room with the piano. We left the floor as soon as possible and later shared the story with some shipmates, and they told us stories of sailors that had died in the barracks. Submariner here. There are few things as unnerving as wondering about the engine room from 2330 to 530 alone on watch. When the boat is largely shut down in port, it becomes a very quiet place. The roving watches usually make it an hourly game to speed through their log rounds, especially in the lower levels. One particular port period, the boat was moored in Pearl Harbor, and a few people started complaining about a real uneasy feeling. I was on the mid-watch as the SEO in the evening and a senior chief came back to do his required three-tour. We saw him walk past us maneuvering on his way to the shaft alley. This particular senior chief was the crusty old salt type, and would usually spend a bit of time just sitting in the lower levels of the engine room alone contemplating life, so we expected as much. What we didn't expect was for him to literally run into the maneuvering area a few minutes later. The man was pale-faced and breathing heavily. We sat up straight, our eyes as wide as our thoughts, thinking we were about to have to announce and fight some ship casualty. He slumps into the Edo chair. A few tense, and silent, moments go by. We're on pins and needles. He finally opens his mouth and tells us about the ghost in Shaft Alley. Swears a sailor passes by him as he's sitting on a trash can in Shaft Alley. His first response was to call out to the guy and see who it was. But then he realized this guy isn't dressed right. He describes what this guy was wearing the old World War II naval uniforms. So he quickly gets up to catch up to the guy, and he does. Catches up to him all the way back. The guy turns towards the senior chief. It looks right at him. Then he turns away and literally walks through the back end of the boat. It's now that the senior chief decides it's time to leave Shaft Alley, and promptly does so. He swears up and down that he knows what he saw. I sure as hell wasn't about to leave maneuvering that night to find out for myself. One of my drill sergeants actually has a creepy story from one of his Afghanistan deployments. He was infantry, so being in the field and out of missions for multiple weeks wasn't uncommon. One night, while sleeping in a fighting position he dug, he felt something nibbling at his feet. He woke up and kicked it off and what he saw wasn't any type of marsupial but a little humanoid figure that he could only describe as looking just like Gollum. But being in the field with little sleep, he chalked it up to just seeing things. A couple days later, he and another guy were on watch and the other guy pointed out something and said what the F is that? And pointed at a stone wall in the distance. My drill sergeant looked through these binoculars and, crawling across the top of this stone wall, was the exact little humanoid creature he encountered a few nights before. As a pilot embarked upon a naval vessel in the Red Sea, my job was to protect merchant vessels from boat-borne IEDs and surface-to-surface -surface missiles from the lovely country of Yemen, which is going through a nasty civil war. We would fly ahead of any vessel that we were assigned to protect and look for anything unusual, and if need be, neutralize the threat, fortunately we never had to engage anything. At the southern end of the Red Sea, the distance between the African continent and the Middle Eastern Peninsula gets very small, forming the Straits of Bab al-Mandab. It was very common to see small boats darting back and forth from Djibouti to Yemen and vice versa. That year, there was a severe famine going on in Somalia, and many Somalis were trying to escape. Many would pay smugglers to take them by boat to Yemen. What they didn't realize is that Yemen is even worse than Somalia due to the civil war. Not only were people starving to death in Yemen, but cholera outbreaks were common, and to top it off, the violence there was unbelievable, even by Somali standards. So these poor refugees would end up in Yemen and basically be like, 
Wow, this is even worse than where I came from. We need to get out of here ASAP. The ones that could afford it would then hire another smuggler to take them from Yemen to Eritrea or any country on the African side north of Yemen with the ultimate goal of making it to the Mediterranean. While flying, we would come across large rickety boats with low freeboards loaded to the brim with people. Any time my helicopter got within a few miles of them, they would stop their boat and all raise their hands, clearly out of fear. I would always try to give them plenty of room, as long as they were not headed towards any of our ships, to show I meant them no harm. The freeboard was so low on their boats that they were hard to see visually, and sometimes our radar would have trouble picking them up, especially in rough seas, and we would accidentally fly over them, causing them to panic. Overall, I just tried to leave them be and show we meant them no harm. I had a job to do, and unfortunately, there was nothing I could do to help them. One time, however, one of these vessels loaded with refugees was headed directly towards our convoy of ships. It was a very unique looking boat, with unusual colors for that region. It's very memorable looking. They were several miles away, and from my position in the air, backed up with radar, I could see they were on a direct collision course. It was clear they did not know nor could see that there was a convoy of warships headed towards them. They did not have radios on these boats, so the only way to communicate with them was to fly close to them, hoping they would change course. As expected, every time we orbited them, they would stop and put their hands up. I would give them some distance and they would continue on their collision course. After a few attempts at getting them to change course, they either got the message or saw the convoy and made a 90 degree turn that steered them well clear of our ships. With that, I moved on and let them be. Of note, we record every interaction we have with foreign vessels through our forward-looking infrared camera. Fast forward two days later, I'm browsing the internet, and come across an article on CNN International. The article talks about an unknown helicopter targeting a boat filled with refugees in the Red Sea, killing dozens of them. Then there was a picture of the boat filled with bullet holes and dried blood. I looked at the picture and instantly got a sinking feeling in my stomach. The boat looked similar to the one I had orbited several days earlier. I immediately went and pulled the tape from that flight and found the interaction with the boat. My heart sank as I confirmed my fears. The boat in the article was the same boat I saw several days earlier. These people were not bothering anyone and were just trying to make a better life for themselves and their children. To this day, I do not know what helicopter targeted them. There were many countries operating in that area. I doubt anything came of it besides a quick mention in the news. To me, the creepiest thing is how any person can possibly find it in themselves to mercilessly target a boat full of refugees. Back in 2012, I was lucky enough to be a private in the army in Afghanistan. I won't bore you with details, but I meddled with the radios on a small team in a pretty remote area on a combat outpost. We conducted 24-hour operations, and one night, we got this very weird transmission. It came in pretty strong, and we couldn't determine from what direction it was coming in. However, what truly made it odd was what was being said. Now, I'm no linguist, but I know enough about different languages to know this wasn't Pashtun or Dari, or even English for that matter it was straight up Russian. This is when red flags start going up and we begin to make phone calls to our operations center and begin to wake people up. We had a recording device and managed to catch most of the broadcast before it stopped completely. We didn't have any Russian linguists with us. We had no idea what was going on. We sent a copy of the recording over the high side to get information translated. I knew one of the warrant officers in my unit was also a Russian linguist back in the Cold War era and had him have a listen as well. He was rusty but got the general gist of the message. It was a distress call asking for help, that their base was being overrun and being attacked. This was even more confusing as there hasn't been a Russian base in AF since their occupation. We schemed a lot over what caused it. 
He said maybe it was a pre-recorded beacon that may have just randomly gone off after all these years. Who knows? The only thing that bothered me with that explanation was that the whole thing didn't sound like pre-recorded audio. There was an obvious level of distress in their voice. However, there was no background noise to it. I was in the US Navy and worked in communications. I was a supervisor on my watch and enjoyed working the night tours while on deployment. We stood 12 hour watches from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Around 2 a.m., I hear some chatter over the 3MC, which is similar to our internal speaker system and is used to communicate between a few different stations on the ship. It's the bridge asking combat if they see anything on surface or air radar, maybe 10 miles out to our west. Combat returns with a negative, and I don't think anything of it. About 15 minutes go by and the bridge asks again, are they sure there's nothing there? Then they ask us if we have any message traffic about any ships in the area, aircraft or anomalous weather patterns. I ask one of the guys on watch to perform the request, and now my interest is piqued. I walk out of the communication center and head up to the bridge. I was on a frigate, so the walk was quick, and I got up there and asked what was going on. One of my buddies points me over to the port side and we walk over. There are about 5 or 6 circular shaped lights about 10 to 15 miles out in the clouds, pretty large. They aren't moving or flying around, just looking stable. These lights are also casting light downward on the ocean, and you can see the light refracting back onto the water. From what we could see, it didn't appear to be lights shining up from the water because they wouldn't pass through the clouds. The clouds weren't super thick, it was lightly overcast, and it was the middle of the night with no other light pollution on the water. There was nothing in the message traffic about any ships, subs, or aircraft in the area. We were hundreds of miles from land and the last report of any unusual weather patterns was a water spout a few hundred miles away. We tried to take pictures with our onboard digital camera using a long exposure, but we couldn't capture the phenomenon. After about 90 minutes, the light slowly faded and then completely disappeared. I'm sure there was some sort of weather or atmospheric condition for what we saw, but for all intents and purposes, it fit the description of a UFO. Unidentified flying objects. I'm a former USCG officer. A ghost and some creepy stuff happened when we were removing the old Fresnel lens from the Prescott light in Michigan. Also, I've seen some weird, creepy lights in St. Elmo's fire near the old Wagas Hans light. Compasses and radios all quit, radar and GPS wouldn't work either. The light near Sturgeon Bay is haunted as well, and we stayed at the light near two rivers, and the whole family saw the ghost. There are several lighthouses in the Great Lakes that are open to active, reserve, and retired military members as vacation rentals. We stayed at Raleigh Point Lighthouse and Sherwood Point Lighthouse. They have visitor logs that are like diaries, and multiple stories are in there about the hauntings, dating back to the 70s. I know that Sherwood Point is haunted. Fort Carson during Warhorse Strike 2015. It was the last day of a two-week field trip. We were all packed out and ready to go home but couldn't do so until the next day because our good friends in the Artie Battery lost a pair of C-in-the-dark flavor MREs. Naturally, we were all out of dip slash smoke slash caffeine and from our location we could see our barracks near the helicopter field. One of our I'm retiring this year. F all of this E8 types who was fiending for some nicotine arranged a night patrol. We would do a nighttime tactical movement to gate 20 where we would secure a target of opportunity in the form of his wife slinging a few logs of his choice, some great value addition red bulls, and a couple cartons of bad Paul Malls or something equally cheap over the gate for us to recover and be back before sunrise. Off we marched, fueled by addiction and boredom. For those at Carson, I believe it was TA-7 along the road just beyond the north ridge of the impact zone running east-west. 
Now, this training area was our backyard. We did ruck marches and similar exercises here almost weekly at night, day and every time in between. We were not sleep deprived as we were just waiting for Artie to unmess their lives, and by all means, this should have been across the valley and get on the parallel trail kind of op. In the bed of this valley there is a stream. It was early fall, and the weather was largely dry. So sound carried and smell was dampened. The night was crystal clear with a slim waning crescent of a moon and pretty limited illumination, but hey we had lucky darkies on. The very moment we cross this stream, we are hit by the most repugnant smell. Not a skunk, or a wild unwashed animal but the kind of smell that is only associated with meat gone bad. It's not uncommon to find dead deer and the like out here, but we'd been training in the area all week. There was nothing here the entire time, and this is the kind of smell that you wouldn't have missed had you tried. As in, some advanced decomposition nonsense. We wanted our drugs. So we pushed on, writing it off as a dead animal. The forest surrounding the stream was about 200 meters across, only taking us a few minutes to pass through. Myself, being the other NCO in this party, was at the rear of the train to make sure nobody got lost in the dark. So, I've been followed before. I hunt and enjoy being alone. When you get that gut feeling that something is watching you, there is no logical explanation. The trees obscured our vision to the rest of the unit and I was at the rear of the party. When I look back, there are a pair of gleaming eyes in my night vision no more than 10 meters away. Unfortunately, we had no live ammo. Although I would not have wanted to explain that to the O types. It is equally unfortunate that we had places to be, so we could not investigate. Bet your ass. I hurried on out of there and scaled the other side of that valley. We also took the long way home so as to enjoy our spoils and relative privacy. Supernaturally, I can only think of what was rumored to be some haunted living quarters at Duke Airfield an adjacent site to Eglin Air Force Base in West Florida, and spending some time there on a sweet detachment to the Air Force's security during the early Iraq War. I was coming out of the bathroom in those living quarters on a break, I don't even say latrine anymore. Wow, it's been a long time, and saw this young woman who just looked like she was tired and disgruntled at something. The look on her face, the way her hair was a little bedraggled, the wrinkles on her clothing. I saw her go left, the same way I was going to head out. I turned the corner and didn't see her. I went outside and didn't see her. Couldn't have been 10 seconds behind her. I asked my Air Force counterpart and the patroller outside out of curiosity if he'd seen a tired looking female come out before me, and he said no, no one had. Admittedly, we weren't on the clock, we were parked in a living quarters parking lot. So my counterpart probably had his nose in something like his logbook or adjusting the radio to not have seen her. Still, that was one fast mover to leave the outside exit area before I could get eyes on her again. To this day, there's just a little bit of wonder left over that she actually was the ghost and vanished around the corner. I can't even recall hearing the front door open and close. Distance, probably. Realistically creepy. I worked early in response to the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Between keeping seagulls off corpses washed up on beaches from capsized casinos, to working with cadaver dog teams, passing by miles of just driveways and cul-de-sac roads where houses and Walmarts used to be, I have too many stories, and often only enough resilience left to talk about one of them in detail every now and then. A buddy of mine was stationed at Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa in the aughts. It was a regular day full of standard base activity, indoors and out, when the sirens went off, followed by a warning for all staff to report to the base's mess hall. My friend, and everyone else, was quite confused but followed orders. Upon arrival at the hall, they found it was full of the base's staff with a uniformed officer taking roles. The base commander settled everyone down and advised them that everyone was just taking a short break, that there was nothing to worry about, 
and that everyone would be back to work shortly. Everyone sat at the long lunch table scratching their heads and discussing what could be up. This particular room in the hall was interior and had no windows. Once the roll was completed and everyone accounted for, the commander left, and soldiers carrying automatic rifles closed the doors to the hall and stood inside them at attention, essentially barring anyone from leaving. This raised the chatter quite a bit, but nobody panicked. Only a couple of minutes later, an incredibly loud engine sound can be heard approaching the base. As whatever is making the noise lands, it shakes the entire island. Framed photos fall off the wall, and trophies in glass cases are shaken over. The engine hums and shakes, then ceases. Chatter again rises sharply, as speculation about what the hell's going on increases. After about an hour, the noise starts up, and the island shakes again as whatever it is takes off and quickly fades away. Shortly after, the base commander enters and says everyone can get back to work, warning them not to discuss today's break and to simply forget about it. When I asked him what he thought it was, he immediately suggested that it was some kind of classified skunk work spy plane, maybe the Aurora, needing to land for emergency repairs or refueling. Of course, he said, since they kept us all from seeing it, I'll never truly know. So I'm currently stationed on an aircraft carrier, which was commissioned in 77. There is never a lack of creepiness about that thing at night. I work security on it at night, and we rotate from nights to days every so often. I remember one night my buddy was heading up to the flight deck with a rifle from where our armory is, first deck, up to the flight deck, fourth level, which is a five-story difference. It's a lot of distance to travel alone at night. So he gets to a certain part of the boat that is almost pitch black, one state away from the flight deck, and he hears these footsteps behind him. He looks back and no one is there. So he picks up the pace, and as he does, he hears the same footsteps. He looks back, and this time he sees a dark figure about 30 feet behind him. At this point, his fuck that switch turns on and he starts briskly jogging. He then hears the footsteps pick up the pace and run after him. He dead sprints up the last flight of stairs up to the flight deck, and hustles over to where we are on the front of the ship. He's white as a ghost and tells us what happens. We will stay away from that area of the ship now. Other than that, down on the seventh deck of the ship, second to last deck before you hit the hull, there are munitions storage areas, basically where we keep our bombs for planes. Well, back in the day, a little girl fell down one of the ladder wells which is legit a six-story drop to the bottom. She ended up dying. There are chains and various other items that can be moved, and they say at night, if you're not paying attention, zoning out, she'll come by and rattle the chains hanging from the ceiling and move things. In the fantail, which is an area that is outside the ship that looks over the water on the back of the ship, there are multiple ghosts that mess with two lookouts that stand watch out there. One of the ghosts is of a little girl. You'll hear her giggling, then a bouncy ball bouncing on the deck out there, then a splash in the water. There is also a ghost that will come to you as you are nodding off on the watch. He'll be in his dress uniform, he'll tap you on the shoulder and say don't report this, then he'll jump into the water. Other than that, there is always a constant feeling of being watched at night if you are alone in certain areas. The only other story I have is the time I played with an Ouija board, but that's a long story. I was in Iraq in 06 and my month was up to rotate to the FOB for guard duty. We used it as a break from patrolling the city we were in. The place was called Baharia, and it was a massive compound that Saddam's sons used to rape and torture women. Supposedly, we never actually looked it up. The guard tower was two stories high and you had to use a metal spiral staircase to get up to the second floor. One night, about halfway through our post, my buddy and I are passing the time by BS when we hear someone sprinting up the stairs in full gear. It was loud. We quickly grab our helmets and put them on while I flick my cigarette out. We wait. And wait. 
Slowly, I turn around to look at the stairs and grab my sure fire and saw. No one is there. I tell my buddy I'm going to go look and make sure the cog isn't lying in wait. I make my way down the stairs to the entrance of the tower and use my sure fire to look down the road in front of me and to my right. No one is there. No truck snuck up on us and no gator vehicle was outside. The walls on both sides of the road leading to our tower were 20 feet high and had broken bottles at the top, so we knew no one climbed over. Tower 5 was also at the corner of a compound that was miles long on each side. I went back upstairs and told him I didn't see anyone. He didn't believe it and checked himself. When he came back up, his face turned white and we sat in silence the rest of our shift. We always traded when we could to not go back up there. While serving in the US Army in Germany in the 80s, my job was to guard the border and do patrols at night. One night, we came upon a balloon flying through the sky from the east. This was a no-fly zone and seeing this balloon freaked myself and my sergeant out. Later on, we found out that it was defectors from East Germany and their families flying in the balloon, and they landed safely about 4 miles from us. Although I never got to see the family, I later found they had tried once before and failed. Freedom at all costs. I still have chills from seeing that thing blasting the gas nozzles to lift it along. It turned out to be a huge event, and the balloon caught fire and almost crashed. It was shocking to see that thing coming across the border and wonder what it was. I have a buddy who told me a story that he probably made up, but it makes a great ghost story nonetheless. I'll recall the story to the best of my ability, but I will not be able to do his story justice since I haven't heard the story in a few years. This is all classified according to him. He was stationed at a base in the Middle East somewhere. The base was surrounded by a wall that had guard posts at various locations around the wall and one or two other locations that soldiers would keep post, including barracks. There was also a big abandoned warehouse on the base that was not being used. It had huge heavy doors that opened outward from the middle, which were always closed. Soldiers had to walk past this warehouse when switching posts. Well, one night when my buddy was in his barracks, gunshots went off. Everyone rushed to get geared up and figure out what was going on. Once they figured out that the gunshots came from inside the base, they went to the location of the shots. Two soldiers were posted up, guns pointed to the old warehouse, and they were freaked out. One of the doors to the warehouse was pushed slightly open. They yelled at the two soldiers to come see what the F was going on, but the guys didn't budge. They said that something big and black had just ran into that warehouse. Once they calmed the two guys down, they did a sweep of the warehouse and found nothing. It took two soldiers to push the door shut again. The next night, there was screaming coming from inside the warehouse. They did a sweep. Nothing. The next night, more screams. On the third night, another group of soldiers shifting locations opened fire. They basically had the same story as the first group. They said it was fast as F and basically moved faster than they could aim and shoot. Again, the door was pushed open. It took two guys to close it. After this went on for a while, and the soldiers were found mentally healthy, a bigger investigation was set up. They pointed some special cameras at the entrance to the warehouse, set up some guys outside, and waited for something to happen. Well, one night, the door was pushed open on camera, and there was basically a demon that stepped out and started screaming bloody murder. The guards opened fire, and the thing sprinted faster than humanly possible back inside the warehouse. Both doors were flung open and the thing just screamed. More soldiers came and did a sweep. Nothing. Around this time, the soldiers at the base started to piece a few things together. They had always known that a village near the base has a curfew, and no one stays out of their houses past nightfall. So some went to investigate why. And long story short, 
The villagers told them that there was a god of death in the area and they dared not stay out past nightfall. At around the time they learned this, a special team came in with more equipment. Some bigger guns were sent in, including my buddy with special recording equipment. They dragged the big double doors open and set up inside the warehouse. It was pitch black, but they could see with their equipment. They set it up so two guys sat facing each other, making a square of four guys total. About four hours went by without anything happening. Then, the guy across from my buddy started making a hand signal. He was signaling that something was behind my friend. The guy to the right of my buddy was dozing off, and the other soldier across from my buddy was perfectly still. My buddy did a 180 from his chair to a crouched position, giving room for him and the guy across from him to open fire. He said when he turned around he just saw this humanoid demon, around 9 feet tall, with piercing eyes, and menacing as possible. When he opened fire, the thing was so fast it basically teleported to the side and up the wall until it was on the ceiling. They continued to open fire, but the thing was fast and kept appearing behind each of the soldiers, endangering them. Eventually, the soldiers got the equipment and abandoned the building. Their cameras apparently captured everything. My friend was debriefed and told to never speak of it again, and the building was demolished. The villagers related the demon to an old mass grave near the base, which, after the events above, was dug up, and everyone was given a proper burial. I without a doubt did not recall everything correctly, his version had way more detail. The way my buddy tells this story is so convincing and detailed that it's hard not to believe him, but the story is so incredible that it's very hard to believe at the same time. I wish I could get him to type it out for y'all because it's simply amazing. I was in the Navy from 2001 to 2006. I saw some messed up things, but this one took the cake. I was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia, and at my squadron our supply officer, Sup O, was this really nice guy. A bit of a nerd type, but overall really chill and down to earth. He always went out of his way to help people and would also give us extra gear if we asked. I'd even been to his house a few times for cookouts and just to hang out. He would, however, take a lot of time off and would frequently leave early on Fridays. Around this same time, 2004 or 2005, the local PD had a crazy investigation on their hands. Suitcases full of human body parts were either washing ashore or being found on the side of the road. Nobody could figure out who was doing it or why. I mention this because a few weeks went by and an all-squadron email went out saying the suppo's wife had gone missing and if any of us had seen her or heard anything about her whereabouts to report it immediately. Of course, nobody comes forward with any information because nobody knew he was married. I've been to his house and never saw any photos of him with his wife. To me, it seemed like a typical bachelor pad. Anyway, a week goes by and police search teams find a body in the woods, and it's confirmed to be her. It's all over the news that they found her, and when they interview him, he's stone-faced. Like zero emotion at all. After a lengthy investigation, he confesses to killing her and dumping her body in the woods. He also confessed to putting one of the suitcases of body parts on the road but not any of the others. This shook me up because I felt like I knew the guy pretty well. We joked around a lot at work and he just seemed like such a normal guy. My grandfather was a pilot in the Turkish Air Force many years ago, and as part of NATO, they sent him to Canada to attend the Air Force Academy. Just to give you some context, he is a very uptight and serious person. Often, the reason being a soldier comes into play. He is the reason why I know a lot of astrophysics. He guided me to science and facts his entire life. Anyway, he told me he and the rest of the school, including the flight instructors, witnessed an UFO hovering above the main building. He said it came so close to the ground that it was basically impossible to not notice it. Then, just as people are perplexed, 
a UFO shoots straight up almost instantly, generating G-forces that would easily kill a human being. I never saw a UFO with my own eyes. Every object I have ever seen in the sky had an easy explanation. Some took longer to realize, but now it comes to me very naturally. I'm a little skeptic about the whole alien visiting Earth thing, but science says it is not impossible. Fermi's paradox can be easily solved. Edit, I just talked with my mother, he is also my mother's father. She gave me some more details I couldn't remember. It was during the winter of 1958 to 1959 and after the meal. My grandfather didn't like to talk about these things in general. I pushed him harder and he spilled some more details, but I forgot some of the details. Thanks mom. I have to preface this to give context, and I'm tired and on my phone, so this may be messy and kind of long, so I apologize. At the time, I was working nights in the munitions storage area, which is fenced off with barbed wire. The whole area is pretty spread out, with multiple buildings and definitely large enough that you generally drive around to get to other buildings. Due to the nature of the job, the buildings are spread out with clear space between them. Anyways, the only people in the bomb dump on this night are the roughly eight or so of us in my shop and the one guy in control that night. He was in another building, and we had a direct line to him on what we called the bat phone, relevant later. This is summer in SC, and about 2 or 3 AM, so the air was warm and very still. No breeze at all, and we had the break room door open while we watched a movie, we were on flight line support standby, and nothing was going on. The rumor was that the small building we worked out of had been built by German POWs during the war, and I know for a fact that there were some there back then. It was small, with a main break room, a small dispatch office through a doorway, and a couple of offices off of that one. There were two doors, one in the break room and one on the same side of the building in the dispatch office, roughly 20 to 30 feet away from each other. Both had push bars on the inside, but only the break room door could be opened from the outside, as the dispatch door's external latch was busted, and only the internal bar worked. Well, all of us, minus the guy locked down in the control building, for security, are in the break room when suddenly, ka thunk, loud from the dispatch door in the next room. It was like someone was rushing through, slammed the push bar, and the door swung open then swung back shut after a couple seconds with a slam. We all look at each other like WTF? And start to check it out. We had mag lights in our crew books, so a few guys grab them and sweep around the building from both directions. Another guy calls the controller on the bat phone, who picked up and denied that he was messing with us. There was no way he could have messed with us and made it back to his phone in time, let alone do it without being seen or heard. Anyone with experience knows how it sounds at 3 a.m. in the SC summer. You could hear the beeps from code keys being pressed hundreds of yards away. No joke. No way he hoofed it back to his building anywhere near fast enough, went through the halls, punched in his code, and got to the phone in time. But the stuff that got me was that damned bar. The door simply did not open from the outside, and we all heard that bar get pushed in hard the door swing open, hang there for a couple seconds, then shut. And there was absolutely no breeze, and had there been, it would have blown past us sitting in front of the only other door. It's extremely strange. As an aside, there would be random times that I would go to pick up a trailer or something behind one of the other shops at the far end of the bomb dump, and as soon as I stepped out of my truck to do my inventory, I would get a super bad vibe. I'm talking the heebie-jeebies like no other, and as best I can describe it, it felt like something was right above and behind me, and just hated me being there. It was just seething anger, rage, and hate, and it wouldn't go away until about 15 minutes after driving away from that building. One night, another driver who had arrived there shortly before I had for a trailer asked if I had a weird feeling there, which sure I had, so I know at least once someone else corroborated it. All of this happened at mid-shift, which was 11 a.m., 
I heard a few other people's stories about weird stuff that would happen at night, but since they aren't my stories, I can't vouch for their veracity. The only other thing that happened to me there was that I swear I saw the clear silhouette of a guy walking in an open field between igloos. As I turned to punch my gate coat in, in the corner of my eye I distinctly caught the motion of two legs and an arm sticking out, like someone in mid-stride. When I turned back, it was just an empty field. That one could have just been my mind playing a trick, but man, that place could be creepy. It's been damn near 15 years, but still gives me chills to think about it. In 1994 or 1995, me and three friends were outside playing. We were all 10 or 11 at most, and it was dusk outside. We were horse playing, and two of my friends both fell to the ground at the same time. The looks on their faces were of complete awe. The only time I have ever seen such a look is the only reason I understand why such a word even exists. Immediately, my friend and I both look up to the sky to see what they see. An absolutely gigantic metal triangle is above us. This thing is so huge, it blocks out the night sky. It takes up our whole frame of the night sky. Either this thing is really close to us, just above the trees and houses, or it is thousands of feet above us. It's so massive, you can't tell. There is no sound whatsoever. There is a bluish hue to the metal, and it looks like either the borders and edges protrude downward or the middle of the craft protrudes upward. The craft was headed towards the west. As fast as we could shift our focus, that's as fast as this craft could move. It was above us, then it was a speck over Canada, and then it was gone. As fast as my eyes could shift from looking above me to looking over the horizon, that was as fast as it moved. It was in two spots in the sky, but you did not see it move from one spot to the other. It was moving far too fast to actually see it move. I was at the Hollywood Bowl one evening for a piano concert. This place is like an outdoor concert venue where you can see the open sky. At some point during the concert, I looked directly up to look at the stars, and I happened to see a zigzagging UFO. It looked like a bright tiny dot just flying super fast in an unpredictable pattern. Then all of a sudden, it flew away, like it receded from the earth, and disappeared quickly. I looked up again some time later and saw another dot flying straight, but then it made a quick right angle turn and disappeared. This was my first experience of something like this. I doubt anyone else saw it since there wasn't any commotion from the crowd and it happened very quickly. My dad swears up and down that he saw something blip on the radar while at sea in a way that meant it was traveling at ridiculous speeds. He was an anti-air-slash-missile guy in the US Navy back in the 70s and early 80s. Not paranormal, but he also told me about how when they came into Port Inn, I think it was Romania, the KGB types would try to act like civvies and ask them things like how much money the sailors made and such. Of course, my dad told them he owned like five sports cars back home, made six figures, and that the missiles on his ship could accurately hit targets well beyond their actual range. This happened during a rotation at the National Training Center sometime in 2015. A battle was occurring at night. A light appeared in the sky, and for 10 minutes or so, there was silence. This may not seem too interesting until you look at the numbers and statistics. You're looking at massive amounts of people and equipment during a rotation, constant radio chatter, vehicle noise, people talking, etc., and suddenly just nothing. Then the light seemed to make a couple of strange turns, one being around 90 degrees, and split and disappear. One time, at an Air Force base in the Rock, we had a power outage at night. All of us walked out of our hangar doors to take a look at what the problem may have been, and we saw a very, very large triangular shape passing over our hangar. It was a clear moonless night previously, 
And when we went outside to look around, we noticed the starscape being covered then slowly uncovered. There was no sound associated with the event other than the normal sounds of the location. I'll never forget. When I was deployed, we worked out of this ancient dock from the Vietnam era. I worked at a graveyard, so there were never any people there at night except mission essential for any missions we were running. We would randomly hear footsteps walking down the small hallway that was a dead end. Our door was the last one before the little bit that was the dead end. No one ever walked past our door, but there were always footsteps. One night, there were wet footprints down there and it wasn't even raining outside. I wish I could remember the specifics of this story, but I'll try to recount it as best I can. My grandfather was in the British military. He was charged with leading soldiers through a wooded area. I don't recall his rank or where he was serving at that time. A course was plotted and they moved on during the night. Suddenly, a glowing hand appeared before my grandfather's face, as if to say stop. He was so disturbed by what he witnessed that he took it as a sign to redirect his crew on a different path. That night, another group of soldiers on their original path came under enemy fire, but my grandfather's crew was safe. To this day, he strongly believes he witnessed the hand of God. He has never been excessively religious, does not attend church, and has never experienced anything like that before or since. I must try to get more details on this story. So I'll paint a picture moonless night at a cop at the bottom of a valley in Afghanistan, so it's absolutely pitch black. I'm sitting in one of four towers doing my two-hour rotation when all of a sudden I hear this blood-curdling scream that keeps coming and going. So the first thing I do is pick up my radio and ask if anyone else hears it. We all do and everyone is freaking out, including the SOG. We all think somebody is dying right outside our wire and nobody can see anything moving. After about 15 minutes of this, one of the Afghan interpreters comes out and screams, it's a cat in heat, you idiots. Nobody on guard had ever owned a cat. During Desert Storm, my father was in Saudi Arabia. He worked in a fairly tall building, like five to six stories, and was one of the tallest ones there. Well, they'd get bored and go to the roof and throw water balloons at people. They were told not to buy some higher-ups, but my dad was the commander of the unit, and they did it anyway, as the unit commander before him did. One day, they got a package in the mail. In it were pics of them on the roof, with targets and marker drawn on them. They never found out where or who they came from. They still went up to the roof but only threw water balloons at night. US Air Force here. Not allowed to say what I do, but my frame flew in Vietnam and carried dead bodies back and after Vietnam it was repurposed. All of the older frames from that era are supposedly haunted from dead soldiers. I've spent mid-shift, midnight 7 am, on these frames and I've heard people scream out in pain, I've asked for a tool and had someone hand it to me, and then turn around and they were gone, multiple times you'll hear someone's name being called. I don't believe in ghosts but those frames creep me out. A branch of a family-friendly place popular with NS men and soldiers was undergoing a renovation. But a portion of it was still open to the public. There was one night, roughly after 9 p.m., I needed to use the washroom. Me and friend drove in from the car park, and my friend waited in the vehicle. I went in from the car park front counter, where there is a cash-up top-up machine, and a security officer sitting behind his desk and took a lift up to second floor or third floor where the Chinese restaurant is. If you guys could recall the layout, once you come out from the lift, you turn right as the Chinese restaurant. You walk further as the public washroom. During that night, 
I exited the lift and the air all around me was still and the area was dark. Nobody was on that floor and the restaurant wasn't opened. It was very quiet and there wasn't any breeze. I proceeded into the public washroom and unexpectedly, no one was in the washroom. I proceeded with my business, washed my hands and exited the toilet, heading back to the lift. As I was about to reach the lift and press the down button, I heard a very distinctly door slamming sound behind me. Instinctively, I recognized the sound of cubicle door slamming in the toilet. I froze for a second but acted nothing has happened, and pressed the down button, and waited for the lift to bring me to the car park. The slamming sound was heard again. It was as if someone was in the toilet slamming a cubicle door hard. The lift arrived and I calmly walked in and pressed for basement, as the lift door closed, I could still hear cubicle doors being slammed. I reached the car park and asked the security officer whether anyone was in the second floor. He looked at me and told me the premise is under renovation, no one is on that floor. I asked him whether is he sure. He then looked at me and asked whether I am alright. So I replied him that second floor perhaps is not very clean. He then gave me a strange look. I walked back to the car but my friend looked very surprised and commented that I looked very pale and I was drenched with perspiration. The Opera Song During my military service, we had this 9D8N summary exercise in Taiwan and we usually had 3 to 4 missions per day. I forgot which day was it but we were doing section night ambush. It was spring in Taiwan and the sun set at 5 pm plus. We broke up into sections and headed over to our training area. Each section had 10 trainees and one commander slash instructor with a signal set. We needed to simulate an actual 7 men section. Thus two trainees were tasked to be the enemies and the last trainee followed our instructor as signaler. For a night section ambush, other than forming a section formation, we needed to set up a trip flare, which would light up the area when triggered, and a claymore mine, both of which were dummies but we still diligently set it up according to SOPs. The above was each of our location and the terrain. We were on the higher grounds and were supposed to ambush the enemies on the dirt track on the lower ground. Bear in mind that it was a forest and as our training area was large, the space between each trainee was quite far but we could still roughly see the trainee next to us. We waited for nightfall and for our PC to tell our instructor to begin the mission. I don't recall what time was it exactly but it was pitch black when the signal set crackled and we could hear our PC telling our instructor to begin the ambush as sound traveled well at night. We then prepared ourselves and knew that our two fellow trainees who were tasked to be enemies would then made their way down near trainee 7, to the dirt track. We were not far from the dirt track, maybe 20 to 30 meters away. So the enemies needed only probably less than 1 to 2 minutes to get to the right side of the dirt track to begin the mission. Trainee 1 and 7 had night vision goggles so that they could see where the enemies were coming from. We waited and waited for almost 10 minutes but nothing. This was when my instructor got frustrated and shouted WTF? so short distance and how long you guys need to get to the tracks? And nope, we didn't hear anything from the two enemies. It was at this moment when the signal set, which was connected to our platoon HQ, started crackling again. A lady's high-pitched voice singing an opera song came from the signal set. You can imagine how our balls froze. We didn't know how to react as we thought it might be someone playing a prank on us or something else. This went on for a good 5 to 10 seconds, I couldn't remember exactly how long. Then we suddenly heard our PC over the signal set saying all instructors, abort night ambush mission immediately and get back to platoon HQ now. Our instructor shouted at the top of his voice for all of us to pack up, the dummy trip flare and claymore mine, and also to check where were the two enemies. Now thinking back, what happened next was actually quite comical. We switched on our L torches and ran to the dirt track to retrieve the dummy trip flare and claymore mines. For those who had been trainees, 
you would know that we would always pack everything nicely and accounted for them as we wouldn't want to risk signing 1206 or being confined in camp. However, for this situation, it was vastly different. A few of us held open our uniform top and dumped the dummy trip flare and claymore mine, with wires and pins etc., onto our uniforms and carried them like carrying babies with both our arms and started to run. Just as we were about to run off, the two enemies suddenly showed up by walking from the downhill area towards us and said they wanted to share something incredible with us. My instructor told them that mission had been aborted and we talk when we get back to Platoon HQ. When we got back to Platoon HQ, and also saw how trainees from other sections carried their dummy trip flare and claymore mines on their uniform top like us, it was a comical sight, PC asked all instructors to gather for a debrief and for us trainees, we packed the dummy trip flare and claymore mine into the bags and took a break. Our instructor then came back and asked the two enemies where did they went. The two enemies said they went down the path towards the dirt track as instructed but they didn't see the dirt track at all even after walking for 5 minutes. They knew that it would take only 1 to 2 minutes for them to reach the dirt track and when 5 minutes had passed, they knew something was wrong but they continued walking downhill. This was when they suddenly came upon a small old wooden hut and they stopped. Just when both of them wanted to discuss what to do, they suddenly heard a lady singing a high-pitched opera song and they ran back the way they came from. After running a short while, they saw lights from our L torches and the commotion we had, and they were relieved to be back with our section even though they expected to be scolded by our instructor. Our PC then gather our whole platoon for a debrief and said well, I guess everyone heard what happened over the signal set and I'm sure all four sections heard it. That's why I decided to pull everyone back just in case. This may be signal interference or other things. I will report to Koi HQ for further instructions. We had a technical break that night, meaning we did not have to stand guard and could shine our torch lights, cook and sleep etc. And none of us could sleep that night and all of us were just discussing what happened. We were deep in the forest and there's no civilization nearby, how could it be signal interference? After much discussions, we realized that some sections heard the singing very loudly and some were softer. We didn't know why. Even today when I meet up my section mates, I still keep in contact with a few of them, we still talk about this incident. Balls really dropped man. Next story is not a first-hand experience but it happened to my seniors who told me the story about our Koi line when I was posted back to BMTC to be a commander slash instructor. I still have three more stories, including one which happened at Dogger Bridge and one that happened near Pigeon Hole. We'll share the stories one by one. My BMT was in Tekong at Camp 1 during the mid-90s. And I was posted to the infamous Charlie Coy PL-10. Didn't experience anything remarkable there in my recruits days, only saw a family of wild boars during one of me guard duty prowling rounds on the way to the infamous soak grounds. The three-door bunk was diagonally opposite mine. Only strange thing I saw slash experienced was the bunk doors of the first bunk for my platoon had a pair of 3D stickers of Buddha stuck on them. Second strange thing was that my PC and all the platoon instructors bunk with us on the first night before the rest of the company enlisted following day. I have returned to Tekong during my MP conversion course and had to set up my MG in the middle of an oil palm plantation that was pitch dark behind me. Luckily we failed that mission 15 minutes after it started because of a cock up in my detail. The most happening event was during my ICT many years ago. My unit shared the Malay school with OCTs during our exercise there, sleeping in separate buildings. We completed our exercise early one night and turned into rest. A few of us were woken up early in the morning about 3 plus by a commotion in the next building. We saw some OCTs and their instructors running up to a Land Rover which just sped into the Malay school compound and heard some crying coming from inside the Land Rover. Our conducting officer, who was a regular, 
went to check with his colleague from OCS who was driving the rover. There were lots of shouting inside and outside the rover and even louder crying from inside the rover. Our conducting officer's face turned grave after talking to the OCS instructors and saw the few of us capo from the windows of our bunk. His face turned damn black and signaled us to go back to sleep. The next evening before dinner, he shared with us what happened. He said got some OCTs ya ya papaya never show the forest respect. Wanna pee in the jungle also never say excuse me first. One of the OCTs was peeing halfway when he looked down to the spot where he was peeing and he saw a pair of red angry eyes looking back at him from the spot his pee was landing. Before he could say a word he felt slash saw some sort of a hairy troll jumped up and slapped him. His buddy saw the slap by the creature and the creature disappeared into the woods. Both OCTs were evacuated to mainland and the one who Kenna slapped had one side of his face red and swollen till he couldn't open his eye on that side for a few days we heard. When you start to live in camp, it's a culture shock for some guys who aren't used to picking up after themselves. All of a sudden you're expected to clean up the barracks and change your own sheets etc. There are no women in the camp except for maybe the lunch ladies at the mess and some female officers who are housed separately. So my friend is tidying up his own bunk when he pulls a hair from his pillow. Nothing unusual right? Except that he kept pulling on the hair, revealing it to be longer and longer. Maybe 30 inches, silky and dark. The tiny hairs on the back of his neck rise. He looks around at his bunkmates. Everyone naturally has a crew cut since it's the military. This explains nothing. Not thinking further, he respectfully lays it aside and pretends he hasn't noticed it. This was an incident happening late at night when my friend and three of his buddies were escorting another guy out of the camp. I can't remember why, but it's pretty unusual to book out of camp by yourself at that hour, so it was possibly a family emergency. As they were walking out of the poorly lit area to the front gates, this was many years ago, when things aren't as modern as they are now, my friend sensed something was off. He was looking ahead and chatting to his friends but when he counted the number of people walking together from the corner of his eye, there seemed to be, six, four of his friends including himself, the guy they were escorting and, wait a second. He said nothing about it, but just urged them to quickly escort the guy to the main road and run like hell back to their barracks. Some of our camps are located next to cemeteries. You can look it up in Google Maps. I don't know why this is so, maybe they're trying to scare the guys from going AWOL in the middle of the night? Or maybe it's very removed from residential and commercial areas so the training doesn't disturb the civilians. Lots of incidents have occurred, like happening in on a ritualistic exorcism. You're supposed to report unusual incidents, but I can understand why they leave it out. Similarly, my friend was driving a heavy vehicle through one of these cemetery routes as part of a convoy. For some reason, he got terribly lost. It's not a huge area mind you, Singapore is land scarce as it is. Plus he lost sight of a heavy vehicle that was in front of his face. He's a little lad, but a huge truck isn't something that just disappears round the corner. He drove for 45 minutes like that trying to find the exit and his friends and all the while, he felt something wasn't right. When he explained it to his officer in charge later, he wasn't even punished for going missing because the regulars understand. They know sometimes, things just like to mess with you. The last incident I know of with cemeteries was driving back home after a late night, one of the regulars, who owned his own car. As he passed the lonely bus stop by the cemetery he could have sworn there were three shadowy things sitting there even though the last bus had come and gone. The same guy who was escorting his friend out of camp related another incident when he woke up in the middle of the night. 
He went to maybe sneak in a cigarette, you're not allowed to smoke except in designated areas, on the corridor facing an open view of the forested area outside. At first he thought what he saw was a newspaper caught in the branches, but newspapers aren't starkly white, they don't flap and they most certainly do not dart from treetop to treetop. I've personally seen this forested area it's heavy with the sweet smell of tropical fruit. If you know guys, they'd try to go pick up some free fruit just because, heck, they can, but all I can say is that not a single one of those branches is touched. Ever. Anyway, he went over and tried to tell one of his buddies who promptly cussed him out and told him to go back to sleep because they shouldn't talk about such things in the dead of night. It's a given that you should never answer something when it calls out to you in the middle of the night. It will know your name and if you respond, well. This guy did the right thing when he heard a huge banging on his door. None of the other guys seemed disturbed by it, possibly because they were too tired from running around carrying heavy packs during the day. He heard from the other side of the door, one of the guys from two or three barracks over calling his name and asking him to open the door. He almost did, until he reasoned with himself it can't be anything good. If it was an emergency he would have sought help from people in his own barracks, and if it wasn't an emergency they were probably gonna do something that would get them all in trouble. Wisely he ignored it, but the next day he demanded an explanation from the person he thought he had heard. Save the guy denied ever stepping out of his barracks that night. His bunkmate confirmed it, saying he heard the same thing except that he could see the person in question sleeping peacefully in front of him. This was an overseas training incident. Was it Thailand or Taiwan or, I really can't remember. These guys were there for outfield training, roughing it up and making it, as a platoon across some overgrown terrain. They have check-in points every few miles at designated times just to make sure they don't get lost and stuff and if they do get lost, the platoon ahead of them can backtrack to assist. The guys in this case were supposed to check in at a temple in the middle of the route. They found it easily enough and decided to take a rest there. Some of the more superstitious decided to stay outside and secure the area while the others decided to go in and check it out. This is where it gets fuzzy. The guys who stayed outside and waited got really worried after an hour when the ones who went and didn't return. It was getting dark too. They didn't want to go in themselves, but they couldn't leave without them, so they tried radioing the next checkpoint to tell them what was up. The platoon behind had apparently passed them and people were wondering where the hell they were. They hadn't been missing for an hour. They had been missing for four. The guys who went and eventually came back out every single one of them. However, they all had different accounts of what happened inside. Some claimed they were the only ones brave enough to step inside. Others claimed that every single one of them had gone in, as a platoon. Some said they had been outside the whole time, but they weren't. Another said they had gone in with their CO, but the CO said they had gone in with a different recruit. The concept of time was altered too there was someone who said he had only been inside looking around for 5 minutes before coming back out, another said it was more like 6 hours that he was lost inside. The descriptions of the temple interior were all different. To some it had looked run down and creepy, like no one had cleaned it for years. To others, it was small and well kept, almost modern. Whatever it was, the fact that they had been lost for so long was never officially put to record. Most people say it's scary to be in a cemetery but they're wrong. Cemeteries are places of rest and peace. Temples on the other hand. Well, they're like beacons calling lost souls. told to me by a cab driver as I was returning from a late party, about what he learned in the military. It's the deepest part of night. If you hear someone cackling loudly, if it's evil, inhuman and all around you, don't panic. It's very far away. Just stay calm and carry on with what you are doing. 
but if you hear a soft teasing giggle, like a hoo 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 and it's right behind you, start to panic and pray to whatever god you worship. At this point, he giggled softly, maybe just to creep me out or piss me off. Heard some freaky stuff about the old police academy from a retired cop. Things like hearing military tattoos during the late hours when everyone else has gone home. How he once heard what sounded like a whole platoon of guys walking around on the second floor of a building at night but the lights were all off. Like Tekong, the place where the recruit was found eviscerated, no one is allowed to bring pork, raw or cooked, into the old academy. Bad luck follows those who do. I'm not sure why this is so Tekong was a Muslim burial ground, so that makes sense, but the thing about the academy struck me as odd. Another thing about that place you can never get the cabbies to drive up there at night apparently. They feel the place is unclean. It has some pretty neat colonial architecture, but with all the tales of Japanese atrocities form World War II and the thick looming trees. I understand the feeling the cabbies get. Not so much a military incident, but speaking of Pulau Tekong, I was reminded of a kidnapping slash murder incident from across the causeway in Malaysia and the culprits attempted to flee here, God knows why, I'd have gone north. They tried swimming across the narrow channel that divides the two countries and ended up on one of the many creepy offshore islands. Now, the authorities were clearly searching for these guys, and they tried to do so thoroughly. Even so it was three days later that they managed to find them and by that time, the guys were begging to be taken in. They had gotten so lost in the undergrowth that they couldn't even find each other although they shouted and shouted. Oddly enough, they were found not more than 50 meters, more or less 100 feet, from each other. The person I was discussing this with concluded that they were probably being punished for their misdeeds while on sacred ground. I speculated they could have been delirious from accidental sea water consumption. But that doesn't explain why they couldn't be found even though the island was smaller than the spit of land Jack Sparrow was on. Skeptical. I was pressing a colleague for interesting tales during a smoke break and he told me of his friend who was returning home from camp. Due to some incident, he had to book out late. Now he usually put his backpack into the box on his bike but he was in a rush to get home, so he thought nothing about the weight on his shoulders because it felt just like his backpack. The only problem was when he reached his apartment and opened up his box, his backpack was in the box. He described the feeling as hair raising and uncanny. Frightened, he went to a 24-hour coffee shop and washed his hands and face thoroughly. If he didn't, it would be inviting whatever was on his back into his home. I've had a strange experience on Tekong as well. This is over 10 years ago but I still think about it from time to time. My unit is not based on the island, but we do go there to use the firing range from time to time. I was a recruit at the time and we spent a few weeks on the island doing field camp training which culminated with live firing on the range. During this time, when we were not out in the field we would be quartered at the old barracks. These are the same barracks that had the some pretty horrible stories attached to them such as the famous stand by Oregon back in the day, range was an opportunity for our instructors to be exceptionally cruel to us. It seems stupid now, considering we were all handling live ammunition. We were expected to account for a certain amount of ammunition expended by returning empty shell casings. We kept getting punished for not bringing enough back. I am not sure if they took advantage of the situation or it was just really dark and people were missing the casings. This particular evening we completed range practice at about 9 pm, and the punishment went on till about 2 in the morning. When the instructors were done with us, we had to double back to the old barracks some distance away. 
My platoon being first in the company led the way back. The entrance of the barracks was illuminated by street lamps and as we got back, I saw the distinct shadow of a person running past the front of a building about 10 meters away. My first thought was that maybe it was one of our logistics staff who may have gone back ahead of us but when we got into the camp, I discovered that we were the first back. I still don't know what to make of it, but they say that people can see ghosts when they are feeling down. Basic military training for conscripts is definitely a downer. There were a number of other incidents that took place the few weeks we were there. There is an old plantation there and some of the recruits saw shadows flying from treetop to treetop, and a possession at the same plantation. Come to think of it, even the camp back on the mainland of Singapore was pretty horribly haunted. Many tales can be told of that place. My grandfather fought in the Emu Wars and he watched dozens of soldiers get massacred by those psychotic birds. My grandfather was one of the sweetest men that ever lived. He would always have a big smile on his face and everyone loved him. I have only seen him angry one time in my life and it actually scared me to see him like that. I had discovered a story about something called the Emu Wars where soldiers were used to hunt down emus, and I was laughing about how ridiculous it sounded. My grandfather started screaming at me and telling me not to talk about something that I knew nothing about. He stormed out of the house while I stood there shaking in fear. A couple of days later he returned to our house to apologize for screaming at me. He could see the confusion on my face and I could tell how terrible he felt. I apologized for making fun of the emu wars as I just thought it was funny. He told me to sit down as he wanted to share his experiences with me. I sat down and waited as he began to tell his tale. I had joined the military when I was 18 as I had been living with an abusive father and this seemed like the perfect way to escape. I completed basic training and was assigned to a base. There was very little to do on a daily basis so we were constantly just training and having fun. Our base commander was an older soldier who didn't care about what happened, as long as no one did anything stupid. One morning we were all called out for an assembly and we were all quite excited as we hoped we might get some action. You could see the evident disappointment on everyone's faces as we were told that we were being mobilized to deal with a herd of emus. They were causing trouble for farmers and we were being sent to call them. We were told to be ready at 12.00 the next morning. Everyone was giddy the next morning as it seemed like a fun excursion. There were about 325 of us loaded into trucks as we headed out. It was a long tedious journey and the mood quickly darkened as the heat slowly wore down everyone's mood. There was very little to look at in any direction with only the occasional house. We finally stopped after almost an 8 hour journey and I could see the relief on the other guys faces as we jumped off the trucks. My legs were aching from not moving so long and I had to stretch for a minute to get some feeling in them. We were in a remote location with nothing to see in any direction. Our base commander approached us and explained that a herd of emus was seen about 10 miles from here and we would need to walk to get there as the terrain was very bad. He left about 50 of us back with the trucks while the rest of us marched along. We finally reached the summit of a steep hill and gazed down to see about 250 emus on the far side. The commander ordered us to set up our weapons. We all set up and awaited the order to fire. I was in very good shooter and lined up my rifle on one of the closest birds. The sound was deafening as we all opened fire. I watched as my bullet destroyed half the face of the bird I had been aiming at. Their gaze all turned on us and seemed to be challenging us. The bird I had shot seemed to be glaring at me with its one good eye. A few of the other soldiers took a few steps backwards as the stares from the birds made them feel uncomfortable. The commander ordered us to fire again and stop being such cowards. I once again targeted the same bird and watched in amazement as it somehow dodged the bullet at the last possible moment. Somehow with all of the bullets we fired only 10 or so of the animals lay on the ground dead. I could see the hatred in their eyes as they gazed up at us. 
The commander was giving the order to fire another round when the animals suddenly took off running in the opposite direction. We stood there for a few moments watching them disappear off into the horizon. We were finally ordered to pack up our stuff as it was starting to get dark. We marched back in a disorderly fashion and were constantly on our guard as we could hear running feet on all sides. The emus kept appearing in small groups for a few moments before running away after we opened fire. I could hear the fear in the commander's voice as he ordered us to stop firing as we were just wasting bullets. We kept stopping for breaks as the rest of the company were scared and needed to go to the toilet all the time. It was almost pitch black when we arrived back to the trucks and we were met by scenes of carnage. The bodies of the soldiers that were left behind were strewn about the site with their insides ripped out. The trucks had been savagely attacked as there were evident scrapes and dents on all of them. Whatever had attacked them had taken them completely by surprise as many of them didn't have their guns in their hands. We were all standing there frozen in terror when one of the emus walked out of the shadows and began plucking out an eye from one of the bodies. I raised my gun to shoot it but it ran off before I got a shot off. We stood there not speaking for a few moments until the commander ordered us to set up a defensive ring and drag the bodies out of the way. Everyone began rushing around in pandemonium as we were just so freaked out. It took us almost an hour to move the bodies and then set up a defense around the trucks. I don't think any of us got much sleep that night as we were all on edge. I was awoken the next morning by panicked voices. I pushed myself off the rough ground and walked over to see what was going on. I listened to the conversation to discover that all of the bodies were missing as something had dragged them all off when we weren't paying attention. The commander told us to stop panicking and jump into the truck so we can get out of here. We rushed to gather up our supplies and jumped into the back of the trucks. There was a sense of relief on people's faces as we knew we were finally getting away from this godforsaken place. The relief was short-lived though as none of the trucks would start. The damage that had been inflicted on them had rendered them useless. We stood around deciding what to do when a scream made us all spin around. My mouth hung agape as I gazed at the thousands of emus that had somehow snuck up on us and now surrounded us on all sides. We all began to back up against each other in a vain attempt to get away from them. I recognized the bird I had shot earlier as it stood front and center amongst the others. His face had named crippled by my bullet and as I seemed to be glowing. It turned around and all of the other birds followed its lead. None of us had even thought to raise our guns as we were just so terrified. It took a few minutes for everyone to relax as we were all still huddled together. The commander grabbed a map and discovered the nearest town was about six days walk from here. Most of our food supplies had been destroyed so we were ordered to grab anything that was salvageable and prepare to march. It took a lot longer to get ready than usual as people were fighting over food and water. It almost resulted in fist fights but the commander managed to calm everyone down by pointing out we had bigger concerns. We eventually started marching in a very complex fashion as we all were trying to use others as cover in case of another attack. We were constantly being hounded by the emus as they would suddenly appear in the distance before quickly disappearing from sight. We were all constantly on edge as we had never seen anything like it. We had probably been marching for three hours when the attack began. They just came out of nowhere and there were hundreds of them. I watched as one of them knocked the person beside me to the ground and then used its claws to rip his throat out. The attack was so sudden that many of us hadn't even had a chance to reach for our guns. I had managed to grab my gun and killed the closest emu to me. I was about to fire on another bird but they all suddenly fled. We lost another 40 soldiers in this attack. My kill had been the only confirmed emu kill. There were a few injuries but nothing severe so we continued to march after grabbing supplies from the corpses. Everyone walked along with their weapons ready in case of another attack. It slowly began to dawn on us that we might not make it out of this alive. We set up a camp that night with 25 guards on rotating shifts. I had the first shift and I could hear noises in the distance as they seemed to be circling us. I lay down on the ground after my shift and fell asleep instantly due to exhaustion. 
I was awoken by screams all around us and the sound of rushing feet. I grabbed my gun to discover the emus were launching hit and run attacks on us. I heard a noise behind me and spun around and fired my gun. I watched in horror as I looked at the commander's face and noticed the blood pouring out of the gunshot wound in his throat. He collapsed to the ground while the screams of agony and fear surrounded me. The next morning we discovered we had lost another 57 men. Five of them had died from friendly fire and I was thankful that no one realized I was responsible for the commander's death. We began to march but it was obvious that many of us seemed like they had already given up. The next few days were chaotic as we were being attacked every few minutes. There were less than 15 of us left alive at this point as the damn birds killed anyone they could get close to. We had passed numerous houses as we marched but we discovered that all of the inhabitants had been slaughtered by the birds. The bird I had shot at the start was always watching me from the distance and I felt like he was mocking me. We were barely able to stand and I suggested we take cover inside the next house as we can grab cover inside. It took us an hour to reach the next house which was a two-story. We quickly used what we could find in the house to try and make the house more secure. We pushed furniture in front of windows and used wood to barricade the doors shut. We were running desperately low on ammo as most of our supplies had been lost in our march. We grabbed knives and whatever else we could find to use as alternative weapons. We all looked at each other with a look of defeat as we all knew this going to be our last stand. We set ourselves up in different positions around the house in the hopes of holding out for as long as possible. We knew we didn't stand a chance against these demonic creatures as they seemed hellbent on wiping us out. The hammering at the outside of the building started just after it got dark. It was coming from all sides as the emus tried to force a way in. I heard the sounds of sporadic gunfire from upstairs as they fired down on top of them. It took less than an hour for them to get inside. We tried to use a choke point to funnel them so that we could kill them. Unfortunately this only worked for a minute or two as they breached the house from multiple locations. I was forced to retreat up the stairs and watched as they slaughtered everyone on the bottom floor. I locked myself in a bedroom and knew that I would probably die in here. I had lost my gun while fleeing and now my only weapon was a kitchen knife. The creatures had made their way upstairs and I could hear screams quickly being cut off in the other rooms. Everything was now deathly silent as I awaited my fate. I was near exhaustion and must have dozed off. I awoke the next morning to silence and wondered what had happened. I opened the door to find the house soaked with blood but devoid of bodies. I made my way downstairs and walked out the front door. I froze in my steps and felt my bladder release as I gazed out the door. Thousands of emus stood outside and they all gazed at me. The emu I had shot stood at the very front and he seemed to be smiling with what was left of his face. They suddenly all moved and a small gap opened up in between their ranks. I cautiously moved forward as I feared they intended to just surround and kill me. After I made it through they suddenly ran off into the other direction. It took me another two days to finally reach someone living. It took me another week to get back to my base. No one would believe me at first and a number of high-ranking officers arrived as they wanted to know how many so soldiers could just disappear. They organized another mission with over a thousand heavily armed soldiers. They brought spare trucks to hopefully rescue any other survivors. I kept getting weird looks from the other soldiers as they thought I was somehow responsible for this. They stopped looking at me like this as we started passing the blood-soaked locations where we had been attacked. We eventually reached the trucks that we had originally used and were shocked to discover the mutilated bodies of the soldiers that had accompanied me. The officers looked bewildered as they didn't know how to react to this sight. They all stood there with their mouths hanging agape as the hordes of emus suddenly surround us. They were soaked in blood and seemed to be challenging us. The officers quickly began issuing orders and the soldiers began to gather up the remains and load them into the trucks. We left the site as quickly as we possibly could while the emus watched from a distance. 
The military made up a ton of BS to cover up what happened and paid off the soldiers' families. I was then forced out of the army and threatened with prison if I ever said anything to anyone. I gazed at my grandfather in shock as he sat there weeping. He made me swear that I wouldn't say a word of this while he was still alive. I kept my promise as he passed away a few years ago and I finally decided to share his tale. Be careful of emus as there is something not quite right about them. My grandfather told me what happened when they raided the Fora bunker. My Dadushka, grandfather, Vladimir was in the Red Army during World War II on the Eastern Front from Stalingrad to Moscow to the Battle of Berlin. He had reached the rank of lieutenant and immigrated to the United States in 1953. I was born in America but often made trips to Russia. I loved my grandfather dearly. He would help me with my homework and he grew excited whenever we covered the Eastern Front. He would give me a medal and explain how he won it. But, there was one story he would always simplify. The Battle of Berlin. Every time I would ask, he would always tell me to go read a book or use the internet. I noticed he would always grow nervous whenever I pressed for details. His hands shook and his eyes bulged. I had never seen him so terrified in the time I knew him. Time went on and we slowly drifted apart. One day, I was working at a military hospital during my tour with the Russian army when I got a letter from him. Dear Mikhail, I am currently on my deathbed. As you know, I have been sick for quite some time. I will not leave this earth until I have told you what you always wanted to know. Your grandfather Vladimir. I reread the letter a few times. What I always wanted to know. I pondered to myself. I hadn't thought about Berlin for almost eight years. Nevertheless, I caught a plane to Moscow and I went to his house. The place had nearly fallen apart after years of disrepair. The bank didn't dare try to remove grandpa, mostly because they knew he was a veteran and he wanted to pass away here and partly because he had beaten a few of their agents back with a Masin Nagant and a sword. I opened the door to his room, which by now was an old board. Grandpa, I said and I held his hand. He was now bedridden and he had an oxygen mask over his face. Mikhail. How good. Of you. To come, he said as he breathed through the mask. I nodded. He tried to point to his medals. The Battle of Berlin. The proudest day in the history of Mother Russia, he chuckled. Then I noticed his face fall. It was a cold morning in Berlin that day. I was a captain at the time. Myself and Andrei Kochmarek led a division of the 1st Ukrainian Front. Andrei was my best friend. He shakily pulled out a picture of himself standing next to a young man in his 30s arm in arm. We had just pushed forward to the Fuhr bunker, shooting every single one of those cursed fascists. I took great pleasure in ending their lives. I thought about every single one of my comrades who had spilled their blood in the name of the motherland. He squeezed my hand tightly as tears streamed down his face. I only nodded. What else could I do? He cleared his throat. We cleared the rooms easily. Most of the Nazis were either executed by us or they shot themselves. But then Alexei found a secret door leading to an underground room. My intrigue was piqued. The things we saw. Decapitated and mutilated corpses. Severed limbs. Entrails around us. It was like an animal tore through these people. I looked at him. Why was the room there? I asked. There were these. Creatures living under the bunker. They looked very much like humans, except their faces were contorted into wide grins. They were 10 feet tall and had pointed ears and jagged teeth with misshapen limbs. They were bald, but extremely strong and had sensitive hearing. His grip got tighter. Alexei had his throat torn out, then eaten by one of the creatures. Ivan had his arms ripped off. Kravchenko was disemboweled and dragged away. I wanted to throw up right then and there. I can still hear their screams as the creatures dragged my men away to be eaten. I looked at him. 
But how did you escape grandpa? I asked softly. I hid among the bodies. Whether they were blind or not I couldn't say. One of them approached me and sniffed the air. I can still recall its breath as I covered my mouth. It smelled of rotting human flesh and blood. And its eyes. It's cold. Soulless. Milky white eyes. They were. The worst part of all. They still give me nightmares. He took a deep breath. I made my way to the surface and told my commander about what had happened. He ordered we destroy the entrance so no one else would suffer the same fate. Then. I was sworn to secrecy under threat Stalin would shoot me if I said anything about it. I've kept this secret for more than 70 years, Mikhail, he said. I looked stunned. So that's why you never told me. So. What were the creatures? I asked. He thought about it for a minute. Whether it was one of Mengele's experiments or some kind of Thule ritual, I cannot say. But of this I am certain, Mikhail. They. Were. Not. Human. I think they are creatures from hell. He then fell asleep. I left that night in a panic. What if those creatures were still out there? Would anyone else find them? What if someone released them? The next morning, I read in the obituaries that my grandfather passed away. I then decided to take a trip to Berlin. I walked through the halls of the modern four bunker and went to the ruins of the entrance he had mentioned. Maybe it was just my imagination, but I thought I could hear something scratching against the rocks. Cold warrior here. Scariest thing to me was being up in my helicopter and having intercepts flown on me by fixed wing aircraft. Absolutely nothing we could do about it and clearly the most danger I was ever in. We had several intercepts flown by Soviet maze patrol aircraft similar to American P-3s. Who tried to force us into the Soviet Navy vessels we were flying photo runs on. I also was intercepted by a fully armed Taiwanese F-5 when our ship's position when they launched us pre-GPS was 25 miles off, putting us in Taiwan airspace. They flew several passes on us and would not converse with us on the military air distress, aka guard, frequency that ever military aircraft worldwide is supposed to monitor. We hightailed it back to the ship and hovered just behind the fantail until they set flight quarters and could take us back aboard. It's interesting reading about everyone's reactions to alarms. I have never heard anything in my civilian life that sounds like the distinctive bong, bong, bong of a destroyer's general quarters alarm, which I am grateful for, because that would give me the gut level response others have talked about here. Interestingly enough, even though it was an aviator I only heard the flight crash alarm when tested at flight quarters, so it doesn't have the terror for me you might expect. 3,500 hours of flying and I never heard a real flight crash alarm. Nothing that I saw but what could have happened. Was at Bagram two years ago, average of an IDF every other day for our stint there. One afternoon slash evening I was taking my time and was a bit later to get off shift when the IDF alarms went off. Hit the dirt, waited 30 seconds, grabbed my body armor and went toward the bunkers. Multiple duds had impacted, one hit a revetment probably no more than 100 feet away and another skipped across the concrete and into a clamshell tent. Had me and my co-worker left at our normal time. We would have been right in the path of the IDF that hit the clamshell and had it not been a dud I would not be here today. I've been home for a year and a half now and still loud noises bother me to some extent. I was 19 in Iraq 2004 to 2005. One time, our patrol got hit by IEDs and small arms fire. Right before, we were warned by another unit of a previous attack in which they lost a vehicle to an RPG. I remember passing by the wreckage, there was a mob of Iraqis surrounding it who then turned to stare at us when we passed. Later we lost a couple trucks, 
and none of our vehicles were armored back then. I was a gunner in the lead vehicle. With rounds flying around me, we had to around to find a missing person who ran out of his burning vehicle. This was all in the middle of the sandstorm we got stuck in. This was my very first mission of a year-long deployment. It was a very long long and tiring tour. I worked in the engine room on an aircraft carrier. I didn't see this firsthand, but I saw the aftermath and the photos and talked to everyone who was there at the time. So the generators in the ship are pretty big, think like a story tall, plus another for associated equipment, with a footprint of maybe 1.5 to 2 city buses side by side. One day some weird readings show up on one, nothing dangerous, nothing with a definite cause, just some voltage fluctuations that got sucked up as weird, and something to keep an eye on. I don't think it was even out of spec, just, weird. Five minutes later it exploded. No, giant fireball in the engine room. From equipment that, TRN minutes prior, was functioning identically to the other three generators with no signs of imminence and failure. Fortunately no one was killed or seriously injured, but it could have been so much worse. BTW, someone is probably going to ask this, so no, there was nothing radioactive. By generator, I mean the part with a turbine on the end that turns steam into electricity, not the part with uranium. Never got to deploy, but was almost blown up once by friendly fire. During a massive month-long training exercise, my team was attached to provide security for the forward observer while the rest of the platoon got ready to mount a big L-shaped attack following an artillery bombardment and Apache gun run. So my team got to chill out and watch the whole movement and attack from the high ground. The forward observer called in the artillery. Perfect strikes then he called in the two Apaches. The first one Apache fires its rockets and the other fires its guns, perfect strikes. Then the pilots alternate roles to expend all their ammo. So the guy that fired guns now fires rockets. The Apache now firing rockets decides that now would be an okay time to not bother aiming carefully and here I am watching as these rockets are now slamming into the ground one by one climbing up the hillside towards my team, only stopping like 300 feet away from us. The forward observer was screaming over the radio wave off. Cease fire. I really think the pilot just conveniently ran out of ammo at the last moment. Almost became a statistic. Scariest thing I saw was what PTSD did to a friend of mine. We served in our first squadron together and this guy was easily the most popular guy around. Always smiling and joking. He worked the hardest and partied way harder than anyone. We were arrested together for underage drinking and while I was really stressed about the situation he was able to brush it off like nothing happened. He actually had fun and restriction. Anyway, we both left the squadron at the same time. His new squadron was already deployed so he flew out to Iraq to meet them halfway through the deployment. My squadron was due to head out the month they got back. The day I'm leaving for deployment I run into him at the next. He looks like hell. I tell him I'm getting ready to go and ask him what it was like when he was over there and he looks at me with a blank face, a face I had never seen from him. He tells me right when he gets there he's helping fill sandbags, going nights without sleeping, taking mortar fire, and feeling completely helpless. He spent his whole deployment not working on aircraft but instead sent Tad to help build bunkers because they were constantly under fire. My time in Iraq was actually very enjoyable. Eight tenths would deploy there again. My father was in the army and told me a fairly creepy story once. And my father is not a superstitious person mind you. Forgive my misused words, I didn't serve so I don't know the lingo. 
One night my dad was on guard duty in the barracks. Most everyone was asleep, and it was late in the night. He noticed a light on at one of the bunks and went to see what the man was doing. When he got near he saw that he was reading a book. The soldier reading the book was on the top bunk and told my dad to watch this. He muttered a single word that my dad sounded like Anale and the man on the bottom bunk, who was asleep began to make a strange exhaling noise, and then said what? In a voice that my father said was definitely not his own. My dad thought it was a prank, and told him to shut up Bedford. To which he quickly sprang from the bed and said I'm not Bedford and shoved my dad. Bedford's eyes remained closed through the whole ordeal. My father said that Bedford, was not the type of person to act this way. Thoroughly creeped out, my dad backed away and told the other man to shut the book and go to sleep. He then stayed away from their bunks, but said the man Bedford remained standing still for what seemed like hours with his eyes shut before lying back down. Bedford didn't recall a thing of it the next day. One week after enlisting, a soldier woke up in the middle of the night to pee. He had almost got out of bed when he heard a ball bouncing outside at the corridor. Fearing a commander prowling around, he quickly huddled back under the blanket and peeked out. What he saw was a small boy and his grandmother slowly moving from bed to bed and peering at the sleeping men. When they came to his bed, the soldier closed his eyes shut and pretended to be asleep. The boy looked at his grandmother and said, Grandma, this one's still awake. This actually happens periodically in my camp, though I'm not too sure to whom. Every night, there will be a patrol circling the camp. Two people per patrol. What happened was that when the patrol was in the guardroom preparing to switch with the next pair, a voice came from the radio, reporting that the patrol had reached checkpoint 3. That's impossible because the patrol was in the guardroom together with the commander. This one happened to me personally. My friend and I were prowling at the outskirts of the camp, along the fence that separated us from the forest. It was dark so all we had were, were our torch lights. As usual, we were discussing about nonsense to pass the time. All of a sudden, I heard someone crying softly from the forest. I attributed it to perhaps some muffled animal cry, but the sobbing was slowly building up with more woman-like screams. Creeped me out and I dragged my buddy out on the pretense of needing to take a dump. There's one about a soldier being woken up by his buddy, as per regulation, to accompany him to the washroom. He grumbles expectedly, but follows anyway. About 15 minutes later, he shouts at his buddy to hurry up. The guy replies back not done yet. So he waits another 10 minutes, shouts again and receives the same response. After another 10, he's had enough and so he partially climbs up the partition to shout at his face for wasting his time. What he sees is his buddy, bending over the toilet bowl, slowly consuming the feces left inside. It's at this moment that his half-awake brain reminds him that his buddy had taken medical leave right before lights out that night. Not wanting to antagonize whatever was in there, he lightly says er. I'm going back to bed okay? You're probably almost done anyway. To which his buddy replies, you tired? Or do you already know? I was in the US Army for 10 plus years, here's a story. During that time I traveled all over the world for deployments and training ops. I've seen a lot of the bad things the world has to offer, and a lot of the good. I was an infantryman, and sniper, and during my first deployment to Iraq, I spent a lot of time sitting on rooftops, or inside abandoned buildings. I would watch streets, city blocks, whatever, trying to pin down patterns of life, and get a better idea of what was happening out in sector. Often, my three-man team would get attached to a line platoon, 
and go out on a 24 to 48 hour mission to get eyes on an intersection or building where we suspected the enemy moved. 99.9% .9 of the time everything went according to plan, we would either spend all day looking at nothing, we would get compromised at the break of dawn and get into a day-long gunfight, or if we were really lucky, we would get the drop on the bad guys and end up ambushing them. A couple times though, things would happen that really defied logic or expectation. Now, understand that throughout this whole period of my life I was almost always sleep deprived, hungry, and under extreme levels of stress. I don't discount the idea that at least some of what I experienced was due to the above factors playing tricks on my mind or whatever. Oh, also I've had one of two paranormal experiences from before the army, don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but worth mentioning. Baghdad, we were on a foot patrol to check out a part of our sector we rarely went to, not for any specific reason, the bad guys never went there, so we never went there. The whole area, about three city blocks, had been a Christian neighborhood before the fall of Saddam, but after law and order broke down completely, the Christians were either forced out or murdered. We were just going from building to building at night checking things out. We found this one house with a room on the roof that had been built separately from the main structure, which in and of itself was pretty common. What was strange was that this room had a door that was locked from the inside. It was a sheet metal door with a hand latch on the inside which you could lock with a padlock. For some reason this intrigued me and I had an urge to find out what was in there. So we proceed to go to town on this door with our breaching kit. It took about 20 minutes of solid work before we yanked this door open. First off, at this point I'm a seasoned combat soldier, seen some stuff, did some things, not easily spooked. This room scared me as soon as we opened the door. There was a single hallway leading back to a T-intersection. It was pitch black and the smell wafting out of there was like a butcher shop, blood, raw meat etc. My hackles are up at attention at this point. We enter slowly and spread out to check the structure. There were several rooms, all with dried blood covering the floor, smears on the walls, it was evident some horrific thing happened in here. The last room contained an old metal bed frame, with leather restraints, and wires running off to the opposite corner where a car battery sat. Also there was an oppressive heaviness in the whole place, like the air had weight. We got out of there as quickly as we could. The strangest part was that it was locked with a padlock, and dead bolted from the inside, but there was absolutely no other way out beside the door. No windows, one door, locked from the inside. We never figured that one out, but I still think about it all the time. That same night we found another house locked from the inside, bullet holes all over the walls and please God help us written over and over on the wall in Arabic. The words were written in red ink, and I swear to God, one of the words was dripping wet red down the wall. Our interpreter said it was a bad place and we noped back to the cop as quickly as possible. Anyway, Therese more strange things I've seen but I'm on mobile and this is an ass pain to type up. If Therese any interest I'll share more from Afghanistan, and other parts. Around the fall of 2008, we were back from Iraq and trying to settle back into the garrison mindset, dial things back a notch as it were. Everyone was waiting to go on block leave for 30 days, and come back ready for round two. It was during that time, I got promoted to sergeant and put in charge of my first fire team. Part of every new NCO's duties, is to provide the beer for a platoon widened copped, or non-commissioned officer professional development class basically an excuse for all the sergeants to get blasted together and swap stories, share advice etc. One of the senior guys in my company had been in the army for quite a while, he had been to Somalia for Black Hawk Down, Kosovo, Bosnia, and Desert Storm before Oif and Oaf. He told me about waiting on the Saudi side of the berm waiting to go into Iraq, stealth fighters and bombers flying by overhead to knock out Iraqi army positions, the roar of paladins loosing their missiles against unsuspecting armor and infantry miles away. 
They waited in that desert for six months before finally crossing into Kuwait. By the time they got there the war was pretty much over. He was with an armored cavalry unit, and saw some limited action mainly against poorly trained and equipped conscript units in ancient Soviet tanks. The American war machine swept over those poorly defended positions easily, and within 72 hours the ground war was over. Now I know everyone has seen Jarhead and seen the news footage of the Highway of Death my buddy wasn't involved in that part of the ground action. His unit was part of the anvil the retreating Iraqis hit during their flight from Kuwait. After everything was said and done, they still spent the next few months on the ground basically cleaning everything up. He told me stories about clearing Iraqi bunkers, and trench complexes, sifting through the remains of entire companies wiped out in bombing or whatever. Up to this point, what he described was pretty typical of a major ground action, but I still can't imagine finding myself in the position of being in a major conventional war. He went on to describe one day in particular, toward the end of his time on the ground. They woke up from their hastily dug fighting positions in the middle of the desert, wiped the grime out of their eyes, ate a quick MRE, and trucked to a destroyed Iraqi radar site. His platoon was tasked with collecting any intelligence they might find, and collecting dog tags off of the corpses that littered what seemed like the entire Kuwaiti desert. They still had to be careful, a handful of guys had already been killed by booby traps that the Iraqis strung up before retreating. They arrived on site and started their sweep, there were dozens of charred corpses scattered around outside. The site was a relatively deep and well-constructed bunker, that contained the CP, and a trench line about 100 meters long. Strewn about were pictures of wives and kids, personal effects, letters, books. Anything that hadn't been destroyed in the bombing was collected by the troops as war trophies, or brought back to S2 for analysis. He found himself alone, down in the bunker. It was a rectangular concrete box, with a machine gun slit in the front, think saving Private Ryan. The roof was half collapsed, with a large hole punched through it where a bunker buster had burrowed down and incinerated the occupants. There was a dead Iraqi slumped across a DSSHK machine gun, the Soviet version of Out.50 California he said even then. He got a really creepy vibe down there. Aside from the dead machine gunner, there were the remains of at least three others in there, but they were closer to being completely atomized, they must have been directly under the bomb when it fell. My buddy quickly snatched the machine gunner's dog tags off his neck, stuffed them in his pocket, and left back to the surface. Later on, the platoon was gathered together eating lunch in the scorched sand, he described it like Jarhead where every time he took a step it left a footprint of white sand in the blackened top layer. Anyway, the guys were comparing stories about what they had seen, and what trophies they had collected. They got down to the dog tags they had, and started comparing the number they had managed to collect. Some guys had a pile of tags, others only had a few, my buddy had the one set he found on the machine gunner. He went on to tell some friends about how creepy it had been in the bunker and how he felt kinda bad for that gunner, manning his position to the last, maybe covering his buddy's retreat in the face of the Americans. One of his friends asked what machine gunner? He had been down in the bunker and hadn't seen any bodies down there. Thinking his friend was mistaken, maybe there was a different bunker he hadn't seen, he went back after lunch to make sure. He stepped down into the bunker, and sure enough, there was the DSSHK, with no gunner. He said at this point his hair was standing on end, he was sure the dead guy had been there. That's when he noticed the drag marks through the charred topsoil. They led across the floor and up the steps to the surface. He followed them out away from the fighting position, about 50 meters. Lying in the sand was the gunner. His body was frozen in a low crawl position, left leg straight back, right knee cocked up, left arm reaching forward and raised off the ground as if reaching for something, maybe a way home. He assumed one of the sick men in his platoon had moved the body but when he asked no one fessed up. On the drive back, he realized the machine gunner had been facing towards the Iraqi border.
During the Afghan winter, the war basically shuts down, and everyone takes a breather till spring and summer. The Taliban go into Pakistan, to rearm, and collect new recruits. That doesn't change the fact that patrols still need to go out, and the business of VAR still needs to be conducted. So my platoon gets this mission to go out in striker APCs and post up at the base of some hills on the Afghan slash Paki border. We were told we would be there for three days tops. It ended up being two weeks before helicopters came and pulled us out. The second night we were there a massive snowfall happened, and over two feet of snow dropped. We were snowed in basically. Our four vehicles were in a wagon will asses in, noses out in a circle to watch all angles of approach. Someone was always on guard in each of the trucks, scanning their sector with thermals and night optics. So there we were, stuck with nothing to do. The first day after the snowstorm which lasted two days, I lower the ramp on my vehicle and see fresh footprints weaving in and out of our perimeter, coming from outside, up the hill. Whoever was walking around was barefoot. Naturally I'm creeped out. No one was outside during the snow, except to use the restroom, and all their tracks were easily identified. The mystery tracks kept showing up randomly the whole time we were out there. Eventually I took a small patrol up the hill following the tracks that always led down, never back up. We got to the top of the hill and the tracks just ended. No explanation given. When we got pulled out I took a couple of the other platoons and COs aside and warned them, they shrugged it off. By the time they got back two weeks later they all acted like nothing had happened out there, but one soldier told me the tracks kept showing up every morning, fresh. There were even muddy barefoot prints inexplicably crisscrossing the tops of the strikers. Here's another one, not so much creepy as it is unsettling. So I mentioned previously about how at one point decapitated bodies were showing up daily in sector. Most of the time we would find them slumped over in the middle of prominent intersections, or in front of the one church in sector. Our cop was a Catholic seminary that had been occupied and fortified after the cardinal was drug out into the street, shot, decapitated and immolated. Across the street from our tiny base was a Catholic church run by an old priest we called Yoda. He was super friendly and always helped us out with info. He used to push food and tea on us every time a patrol stopped by. He also ran the religious services we started up for Christians in the company. He was a super sweet old guy, and one night, some men broke into the church, took him out into the street and killed him. After that, we started running more patrols and night ops to try and catch the guys who did it. One morning a platoon got into a car chase with a group of men. They were trying to flee out of sector when we called in helicopter support and shot their car up. One of the guys died inside the car, when we found him he had melted into his seat, all that was left was a charred corpse, his eyes had burst from the heat of the blaze and were running down his cheeks. His buddy was lying in the street 50 meters from the burned out hulk of the car, he had been literally blown out of his shoes, they were still on the road with his feet in them. The third guy had run off into the thick brush that lined the Tigris River. The helicopter shot about 30 rockets into the bush, in an attempt to flush him out, but all it did was set the forest on fire, we found his body two days later, burned to a crisp, curled up in the fetal position. We also found a single hut way out there, we would have never known it existed if the forest hadn't been burned away. Inside was a pile of human heads arranged in a pyramid shape, it was like a nightmare from heart of darkness. The heads on the bottom were decomposed enough that they were basically skulls, empty smiles leering up at us. They got progressively fresher towards the top of the pile, near the top was the weak old head of Yoda, the priest from across the street. I can't fathom the brutality that would lead a human to do that to another person. It was without a doubt one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. Base I was at in Arizona would have stuff randomly move on its own all the time. Sometimes, 
phones would ring but there wouldn't be anyone on the other end, and there wouldn't be a callback number. Turns out, the base was built damn near on top of an old Native American graveyard. Plus, a lot of people have died or killed themselves there over the years. The St. Francis Barracks slash Florida State Arsenal in St. Augustine is supposed to be hunted. It is now the HQ of the Florida National Guard. It was originally a home for monks and friars when the Spanish built it. The British turned into a military barracks. It has been used by US, the CSA and the Brits. Windows and doors slam close on their own. Computers, lights, and office electronics have a history off turning on and off on their own. At night I've heard that people sometimes hear talking, with some voices having a southern accent and others a British accent. Camp Landing is the big training site for the Florida National Guard. During World War II it was a POW camp for German and Italian prisoners of war. Apparently there were some Waffen SS prisoners who didn't think that their fellow Germans were Nazi enough, so they killed a few. They were caught by camp staff and hung. There is also a big Civil War Confederate graveyard on Blanding. In some of the buildings lights turn on and off for no reason and then doors and windows slam shut. It also feels like someone is watching you right over your shoulder. One of my buddies in the Marines got a barracks room in which another Marine had committed suicide in about a year earlier. My buddy said there was just an overwhelming sense of dread and depression in the room. He was allowed to move rooms a few months later. The other guy who moved in to said the same thing. Here are four creepy ghost stories from the Vietnam War. In spring 1993, a Vietnamese farmer was on his way to work his rice paddy when he passed his wife and children in the road. The wife sat on a rock and greeted him scornfully, as his children cowered behind their mother. The meeting shocked the farmer, as his wife and his three children were killed when their village was attacked in 1968 and his house was burned to the ground. Stories like these are common in Vietnam, where rural communities attach deep meaning to spiritual encounters. In this case, the man understood his wife's grave had been disturbed in the village's recent developments. He immediately set out to give them a proper reburial. But there are many, many more ghost stories throughout Vietnam, relevant to the war fought there. Many of those persist to this day. Saigon's Haunted Apartments. The building at 727 Tran Hung Dao in Ho Chi Minh City, also known as Saigon, was a building that housed American service members for much of the Vietnam War. But its construction was plagued by accidents from the get-go, some of which killed the workers building it. Many blamed it on the number of floors the building had, 13, which was considered unlucky. In order to assuage their fears and get the building completed, the architect decided to call in a shaman to fix the building's feng shui issues. It said the shaman brought the dead bodies of four virgins from the local hospital and buried them at the four corners of the building, which would protect it from evil spirits. To this day, residents hear screams of horror in the middle of the night, the sound of a military parade on the march through the building, and the apparition of a spectral American GI walking, holding hands with his Vietnamese girlfriend. The Tunnel Rats Encounter I've kept my mouth shut for almost 50 years, why the hell would I start talking now? Well friends, terminal cancer will do that to you. Things you thought you'd take to the grave suddenly becomes thing you desperately want to tell someone, anyone. I won't bore you with a long lament about my time in Vietnam, it was bad, it was bad for everyone involved, it was particularly bad for me as I was 5 apostrophe 3. If you don't know what being particularly short during the Vietnam War entailed let me fill you in, you arrive in country and a senior officer points at you and says you'd be a good fit for the tunnel commandos, wanna join? Now technically it's a question, as service in those platoons was voluntary, but it sure didn't feel like a question. It felt like an order. And so that was my burden for the war, to be a tunnel rat, climbing down into deep, dank, dangerous tunnels filled with people and animals who wanted to kill me. 
Usually we operated in the huge Chu Chi tunnel complex near Saigon, but not on that day. On that day we were ordered to investigate a tunnel complex way up north, west of Da Nang. Two of us were sent into the tunnel that day, myself and Benoit. Now usually black guys manage to avoid becoming tunnel rats on account of them being so tall, but Benoit was burdened with the double misfortune of being short and black during the Vietnam War, a curse I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. I was first into the hole and Benoit followed, we both had our Model 39s, some C4, our wits and not much else. If you're wondering why we carried the small caliber Model 39s, go fire a Colt .45 in a narrow tunnel and come back to me, the last guy who tried that got a ticket home with blood pouring out of his ears. We crawled for what felt like an age, the tunnel was a tight fit, which meant it was probably freshly dug, it also stank something foul, that usually meant either spoiled food or some poor VC bastard died down there and was left to rot. After about 40 minutes of crawling in total silence I saw the tunnel ahead open into a room, I tapped Benoit on the head with my foot, I heard him ready his pistol. I climbed down into the open chamber pointing my pistol at the shadows, the room was dimly lit by a small oil lamp, it was also deserted. We took a moment to adjust, it was the longest single tunnel segment either of us had ever crawled through, it also had no traps, which was unusual. Where was everyone who dug the damn thing, save for the lamp hanging from the roof and a canvas tarp on the opposite while the room was empty. I approached the tarp and used my pistol to move it aside, behind the tarp was a stone staircase leading down. A stone staircase, this far underground? I whispered to Benoit, VC didn't build this, this is old, very old, older than America old Benoit whispered back with fear in his voice. We've come this far, we have to keep going, I replied. We both walked slowly down the narrow staircase, our flashlights had red lenses and I swear the illuminated staircase looked like we were descending into hell. The staircase was almost as deep as the tunnel was long, finally I saw the staircase blocked by another tarp, light was coming from the other side. I moved aside the tarp with my pistol, my finger trembled on the trigger. My eyes lit up, my heart raced, I almost pulled the trigger, but I didn't. Something made me pause. The room had at least 10 people in it, none of them armed. I pointed my pistol at the group and illuminated them with my flashlight, they didn't respond, they just stood there rocking gently forward and back. Benoit, don't shoot, there's people in here, but there's something wrong with them. I stepped into the tiny room which was lit only by small candles, Benoit followed, we both shone our flashlights at the people, they paid no attention, they continued to rock gently forward and back. I shone my flashlight in one of their faces, I clicked my fingers, she didn't respond. Her clothes told me she was VC, they were all VC, three women and seven men, all gently rocking forward and back, not a care in the world. Their eyes were a solid color, which color I can't really say as I could only illuminate them with my red flashlight. Benoit motioned with his flashlight to the corner, their rifles all sat in a pile. Badly rusted. Jesus Christ, Benoit how long have these poor men been down here? I don't think Jesus Christ frequents this establishment came Benoit's terrified response in his thick Cajun accent. I shone my light to the front of the room, the VC were all facing a small altar, I walked toward it. On the simple stone plinth stood a gold statue illuminated by several candles. The statue was ornately crafted, it was of a beautiful naked woman, the top half anyway, the bottom half was something like an octopus, dozens of tiny gold tentacles had been meticulously crafted to woman's torso instead of legs. The statue had some writing at its base, a writing I didn't recognize, I reached out to pick the statue up and take a better look but Benoit shouted stop don't touch it. I retracted my hand about an inch from the statue, we need to leave this place, quickly Benoit said as he put his hand on my shoulder. Are we just gonna leave them like this? I said as I shone my light in their eyes, we'll plant the C4 charges and put them on a 90 minute timer he said, he was already removing the C4 from a pouch on his belt. 
they're unarmed. I implored turning to Benoit, these people are dead, maybe worse than dead, I saw something like this once before, at home and in the bayou. I didn't argue any longer, we planted the C4 charges in a rush, set the timers for 90 minutes and ran up the stone staircase as fast as we could, it felt like a lifetime till we reached the small room with the lamp. I climbed into the tunnel and Benoit followed, suddenly we could hear a woman's voice faintly calling from far behind us, ignore it, keep moving, Benoit shouted from behind me, I didn't need to be told, I wasn't going back. It was the longest crawl of my life, I saw daylight and kept crawling even though my hands were raw and bloody. I emerged into the light of day and gasped for fresh air, Benoit followed. We warned the others about the C4 charges but told them nothing else. Benoit and I sat in total silence away from the tunnel entrance. Waiting, praying. The ground shook, a dull thud was heard and a spray of dirt emerged from the tunnel. We both breathed a sigh of relief. It is only after an experience like that, that you ask yourself the small questions. To this day I still ask myself, who was keeping the candles lit in that damn room? A veteran comes home. On a Notre Dame alumni website, On Alum remarks about his chance encounter with a guy he had known since grade school. He was working a construction job in 1967 and was on his way home after work one night. He was coming around the corner when he walked by an old funeral parlor. He noticed the man was his old friend Jerry, a guy he hadn't seen in two years. The construction worker was tired and not really in the mood to rehash old times, so he put his hat down and walked by his old friend unnoticed. When he got home, his mother was on the phone, talking to one of the construction worker's friends. She immediately stopped her son to tell him that his old friend Jerry had been killed in Vietnam and his body was at the funeral parlor down the street. Ghouls of the Jungle Marines in Vietnam would often try to recruit locals to help guide them in their area of operations. In some areas, however, the locals were fearful of going into the densest, darkest parts of the jungle. The reason, they found, was the local superstition that phantoms, called Ma, occupied the trees there. Monignards warned the US troops that reanimated corpses awaited them in the trees. The Marines, of course, shrugged the stories off as folklore. Starting in 1965, it became very real. American troops in the jungles of Vietnam began reporting ghostly figures moving supernaturally through the trees. Others reported fanged creatures with black eyes that would try to kidnap and consume unsuspecting troops. In one encounter, the beasts were found to be bulletproof. It didn't matter what time of day it was, the corpses lived by both day and night. Since the triple canopy jungle kept the sunlight from hitting them, the military's top brass decided to get rid of it. That's the real reason the military developed Agent Orange and Napalm. The Marines would then roll in with flamethrowers to finish the job. Creepy at first. Ended in a facepalm. I was a young sergeant in 2006 stationed at Fort Bliss. Right outside of Fort Bliss was a training area that was near Biggs Airfield. We were guarding some equipment overnight so the company wouldn't have to stay. It was me and one private. I told him he would take shifts patrolling and since we were allowed to have cars out there the other would nap in his car. I woke up to my soldier knocking on my window in a complete panic. It scared me at first. Private, Sergeant. Wake up, there's UFOs out here. Me, what? Private points in the direction and sure I see these lights that seemed like they were floating around and then disappearing. Took me a moment as I had just woken up. That's the Franklin Mountain Range. You're looking at the cars driving on the scenic route. The cars would be visible and then disappear when they went around the corner of a turn only to appear again when they came back around. I was very agitated at first but the next day it was by far the funniest experience I had in the military. I was working the night shift in an old Sith that was originally built back in the 50s. 
I was starting to feel sleepy so I went for a walk to wake myself up and ended up getting lost in the maze of underground tunnels, finding myself in a part of the complex that obviously hadn't been used in decades. Everything looked like it was just left there and forgotten one day, eerily frozen in time. I was extremely tired and stressed out from work and that really didn't help me to be able to rationally retrace my steps. Everything around me seemed like something was hiding in the shadows and watching me. It took a long time, but I finally made it back to my position and didn't tell anyone what happened. Luckily it was the night shift and no one noticed I was gone. A year later we got a new guy, and in the middle of the night shift he got up and went for a walk. A couple of hours later he came back looking like he'd seen a ghost. I just gave him a knowing nod, and he knew I knew exactly what he just went through. I was part of a crew whose job was to decommission old buildings that our agency was moving out of. We would clear the building out of all the office equipment and furniture and then turn it over for disposition. Some of the buildings got demolished and some got turned over to different branches of the military. Anyhow the entire building in this story was a SIF. It was three stories tall and built into the side of a hill during World War II. Top two floors were offices and the lower floor was warehouse space, cafeteria, and the loading dock. We had been working in this building for the better part of a year and all the personnel had moved out by this point. I was working in the warehouse prepping loads of equipment to be picked up by truck and shipped to DRMO. I was the only person in the whole building, in fact the only other person in the whole facility was the guard at the front gate. So I'm almost done prepping truckloads and was about to leave when I see a little hole in the floor of the loading dock with light coming through it which is odd considering the floor is solid concrete, and this is supposed to be the basement. I peek down through the hole and I see a room with a desk and a chair. Must be a sub-basement, I explored around and found a flight of stairs going down. I went down and there's a whole floor of dusty old offices and stuff that haven't been used in years. Not only that, but the stairs kept going down. Turned out the place had five sub-basements. I found the old bomb shelter from World War II down there. The very bottom two levels were machinery for running the building, a lounge for the maintenance crew and a small garage that came out the side of the hill. I'd been working in that warehouse and loading dock for a while by then and had no idea all that stuff was down there below. Interestingly, during World War II the work they did there was considered so important they built a fake neighborhood on the roof with fake houses and stuff so any enemy bombers wouldn't be able to spot it. As a Marine, I used to have the graveyard patrol shift at the Beirut Bombing Memorial. Part of the memorial is dedicated to a veteran cemetery. Oddly enough I never got freaked out being completely alone in a remote cemetery, in the middle of the night surrounded by dense woods on all sides. It was actually kind of peaceful, to be honest. However, one night I was patrolling near the perimeter fence where some of the oldest headstones are, when I heard the sound of a woman humming. I followed the sound and noticed a light glowing through the vines and brush of a large tree. As I approached, I could literally feel my hair beginning to lift as if there was an electric current in the air. I pushed aside the brush and what I saw nearly took my breath away. It was an old, weathered headstone with a large cross etched into the marble. Only the cross was glowing a bright, vivid blue, like a neon bulb. The humming was also suddenly much louder and had a weird plurality to it, like it was coming from hundreds of voices at once. Needless to say, I freaked out. I screamed like a scared little girl and sprinted back to the parking lot. I radioed the guard who was supposed to relieve me and forced him to come early, then spent the rest of my shift in the cab of his truck. I don't think he believed me, but he stayed in his truck and didn't go out on patrol until the sun was fully up. A few days later, I worked up the nerve to return to the grave, during the day, of course. As I suspected, in the light of day it was a completely mundane headstone. There was no name, only the aforementioned cross. I ran my hands over the stone and checked to see if maybe there was some sort of hidden light source or solar panel, 
But no, it was just plain, solid, unremarkable stone. The humming was gone, too. I eventually returned to my normal shift, but never again experienced anything out of the ordinary. I never learned whose grave that was, either, but I find myself thinking about it from time to time. It certainly sounds absurd when I say it out loud, and I suppose it could have been a hallucination or a trick of my tired brain, but I don't believe it was. I think it was real, a ghost or a spirit of some sort, but I don't think it was malevolent at all. I was by myself in the engine room of a submarine on the midwatch, just a newly reported sailor trying to find equipment so I could display knowledge to one of the watchstanders. There are a number of bays in engine room lower level with narrow passages that pass through the center. I came down one of the ladders, and I swore I saw someone walk across the ship about 15 feet in front of me. I could hear his footsteps as he walked around a corner and out of sight. Three problems, one. He was wearing utilities, an older, light blue blouse and dark navy slacks. Nobody had utilities anymore. They had been phased out three years earlier. 2. There was only one other person awake in the engine room that late at night, and he was standing at the top of the ladder behind me, waiting for me to come back up with an answer to his question. 3. He wasn't actually there. I wrote it off as sleep deprivation, but I'll admit it shook me for a while. Fast forward to four months later, I had gone out to sea with another submarine of the same type. While I was there, I met a sailor who had previously served on my ship. After a few weeks of standing watch with him, he told me a story of a sailor who had committed suicide while on watch when he served on my ship almost a decade earlier. In engine room lower level. In his utilities. I wish I could have gotten a picture of the look on my face. I'm sure it was the definition of disbelief. This is my dad's story. After he was done in Vietnam he soon stationed at an Air Force base in Greenland. They had bad blizzards often there and when they came through the base shut down and every section of the barracks would take roll call. These blizzards are intense. There were cables running between all the buildings you attached to your person with a carabiner so if there was a sudden whiteout you didn't get lost and die. They had people die literally 20 meters from shelter because they got lost in bad weather and froze. He said for about five months every time they locked down for whether they would hear horrendous screaming outside. Everyone was accounted for so they didn't risk sending anyone out to investigate. They wrote it off as an animal. However, every time this was heard, the engine room would be wrecked. Tools everywhere, paperwork all over the floor, tables and toolboxes knocked over, even one time a several thousand pound jet engine had been lifted from its workbench crane thing and smashed almost 30 feet away. The hangars and engine room had cameras covering every single possible entrance with spotlights that made them clear even in a whiteout. No animals, no people, no anything was ever seen entering or leaving those buildings. Then one day it just stopped. Edit okay, since I have a lot of debate on what could have caused this I will clear some stuff up. This was not something they just shrugged at. It cost a lot of money and threw a wrench in at least one surveillance routine which caused a lot of brass from the DOD and the CIA to breath fire down the base commander's neck. This facility, beyond military function, served as a base for a lot of civilian research as well. There was a full investigation using all manner of scientists, engineers, and specialists. They came up with no satisfactory explanation for what was happening. I do not believe in the paranormal nor did my father. This is the only spooky type story he has from 22 years in the service. No one knows what happened. It was very strange in every way. Hundreds of people wrote reports and documented this, it wasn't just some grease monkeys scratching their heads and randomly guessing. That said, I spoke to my mom. She told me a couple things I missed. After one of these occasions the U2 in the shop had all its electronics turned on. Many of the systems in this plane were special built for this airframe and this particular cruise mission. These systems were complex and archaic. 
Very few people knew how to operate this machinery and the only ones on base that could were two engineers and its crew. It wasn't a simple matter of hitting power buttons and flipping switches from off to on. Another time three barrels of hydraulic fluid vanished and were never found. They doubted the screaming noise was wind because it came in short, irregular, bursts and winds never produced those sounds again. They theorized it was a polar bear but, if it was, its coincidental timing was extremely uncanny. Lastly Control picked up a bunch of weird interference and anomalous readings that, again, had the uncanny timing of happening only when this was going on. They were never able to reproduce these errors in a controlled manner. Edit 2 OK since I am still getting a stream of people saying I believe this was something supernatural or aliens or something. No. What I am saying is that the best possible explanation is a series of many unrelated, unlikely and unreproducible events came together in an also unlikely manner that left no satisfactory explanation for what was going on. The screaming was thought to be a polar bear or something. The radar glitches were thought to be due to moisture but left no obvious signs. The barrels were most likely the result of an inventory error, etc. Etc. However, even with this all in mind, the chances of all these events coming together, in this manner, by sheer coincidence, is astronomical. So no one was willing to say anything with certainty, thus no satisfactory answer and writing it off as an act of God. It's creepy, it's bizarre, but it's not supernatural and the answer isn't simply it's the wind. For more info see my replies to others about the construction of the place, the cameras, etc. My dad's stories. He served in the Taiwanese Marines as a drill sergeant. Much of the ground in Taiwan saw violence under occupation, and it was rumored his base was built on or near a mass grave. Needless to say he's had a few paranormal stories. He had a guy report to him in the morning exhausted but frazzled. The night before, he had been on guard duty, overlooking the firing range. The targets on the range were a mix of clay and wood figures, cut and drawn to look like an enemy soldier aiming a rifle at you. According to the guard, when he'd been bored out of his mind staring out over the range, he saw clear as day one of the clay soldiers wearily laid down his rifle and exclaimed, damn, I'm tired. The guard said he passed out from fright. During the evening, when training was over, the sergeants for the most part had the time to themselves. My dad liked to go snake hunting during dusk, when the heat was rising from the ground and the snakes came out of their holes. So one evening he sets out, carrying a bag, a nice long stick, and a flashlight. As he was making his way across the field, zigzagging in a search pattern, he found himself getting closer and closer to an old, decrepit outhouse that had been abandoned as it was too far from the main base. As he got within a few yards of it, he was hit with a sudden feeling of apprehension, something told him going near the outhouse was a bad idea. At that moment, his flashlight, aimed right at the construct, went out. He fiddled with the battery, smacked it, thought better get a new battery, and turned around to head back. The moment he turned and faced the main base, the flashlight flickered back on. Great, time to keep hunting. The moment he turned to face the outhouse, it flickered off again. Face the base, it flickered on. He did this two or three times, got the message, verbally apologized for intruding, turned and walked calmly back to base. The base itself was surrounded by forest and mountains, the natural terrain of Taiwan. One day a soldier was reported missing. As the day went on, it was clear that he'd either deserted or was in serious trouble. A manhunt slash rescue team was organized and most of the base was out searching for the guy as the rain started to come in. As night fell they called it off, and got ready to try again tomorrow. They found him in the morning, huddled in a wet, dark cave, scared speechless and out of his mind. No one was sure what he saw to cause him to freak out and they never found out. They shipped the guy out soon afterwards. Finally, one of his years on the base, it was hit with a huge typhoon. Typhoons are pretty regular in Taiwan, especially during the summer, 
but this one was going to set records. Everyone hunkered down and reinforced the base as best they could, and it held well, and after days of relentless rain and wind, they emerged to survey the damage. One of the trees on base had been hundreds of years old, it sat on a hill and overlooked the base, and so had been the site of a Buddhist shrine set at its roots. Now the roots twisted and turned into the air, the storm had torn the tree from the ground. And yet, the shrine itself was untouched, even the red silk covering, with nothing weighing it down, hadn't moved an inch despite the winds that had finally torn the great tree from its hill after hundreds of years. The soldiers took this as a sign that despite whatever would be thrown against them, their spirit would remain strong and unmoved. Submariner here. There are few things as unnerving as wondering about the engine room from 2330 to 530 alone on watch. When the boat is largely shut down and port it becomes a very quiet place. The roving watches usually make it an hourly game to speed through their log grounds, especially in the lower levels. One particular in port period, the boat was moored in Pearl Harbor and a few people started complaining about a real uneasy feeling. I was on the mid watch as the SEO on evening and a senior chief came back to do his required 0300 tour. We saw him walk past maneuvering on his way to Shaft Alley. This particular senior chief was the crusty old salt type and would usually spend a bit of time just sitting in the lower levels of the engine room alone and contemplate life, so we expected as much. What we didn't expect was him to literally run into the maneuvering area a few minutes later. The man was pale-faced, and breathing heavily. We sat up straight, our eyes as wide as his thinking we were about to have to announce and fight some ship casualty. He slumps into the Edo chair. A few tense, and silent, moments go by. We're on pins and needles. He finally opens his mouth and tells us about the ghost in Shaft Alley. Swears a sailor passes by him as he's sitting on a trash can in Shaft Alley. His first response was to call out to the guy, see who it was. But then he realized this guy isn't dressed right. He describes what this guy was wearing, the old World War II naval uniforms. So he quickly gets up to catch up to the guy, and he does. Catches up to him all the way aft. The guy turns towards the senior chief. Looks right at him. Then turns away and literally walks through ass end of the boat. It's now that the senior chief decides it's time to leave Shaft Alley, and promptly does so. Swears up and down that he knows what he saw. I sure as hell wasn't about to leave maneuvering that night to find out for myself. Not exactly what you are looking for, but by far the creepiest and saddest thing I've experienced. As a pilot embarked upon a naval vessel in the Red Sea my job was to protect merchant vessels from boat-borne IEDs and surface-to-surface -surface missiles from the lovely country of Yemen, which is going through a nasty civil war. We would fly ahead of any vessels that we were assigned to protect and look for anything unusual and if need be neutralize the threat, fortunately we never had to engage anything slash one. At the southern end of the Red Sea the distance between the African continent and the Middle Eastern Peninsula gets very small forming the Straits of Bab al-Mandab. It was very common to see small boats darting back and forth from Djibouti and to Yemen and vice versa. That year there was a severe famine going on Somalia and many Somalis were trying to escape. Many would pay smugglers to take them by boat to Yemen. What they didn't realize is that Yemen is even worse than Somalia due to the civil war. Not only were people starving to death in Yemen but cholera outbreaks were common and to top it off the violence there was unbelievable even by Somali standards. So these poor refuges would end up in Yemen and basically be like, wow, this is even worse than where I came from. We need to get out of here ASAP. The ones that could afford it would then hire another smuggler to take them from Yemen to Eritrea or any country on the African side north of Yemen with the ultimate goal of making it to the Mediterranean. While flying we would come across large rickety boats with low freeboards loaded to the brim with people. Anytime my helicopter we got within a few miles of them they would stop their boat and all raise their hands, clearly out of fear. 
I would always try to give them plenty of room, as long as they were not headed towards any of our ships, to show I meant them no harm. The freeboard was so low on their boats they were hard to see visually and sometimes our radar would have trouble picking them up, especially in rough seas, and we would accidentally fly over them causing them to panic. Overall I just tried to leave them be and show we meant them no harm. I had a job to do and unfortunately there was nothing I could do to help them. One time however, one of these vessels loaded with refuges was headed directly towards our convoy of ships. It was a very unique looking boat, with unusual colors for that region. Very memorable looking. They were several miles away and from my position in the air, backed up with radar, I could see they were on a direct collision course. It was clear they did not know nor could see there was a convoy of warships headed towards them. They did not have radios on these boats so the only way to communicate with them was to fly close to them hoping they would change course. As expected every time we orbited them they would stop and put their hands up. I would give them some distance and they would continue on their collision course. After a few attempts at getting them to change course they either got the message or saw the convoy and made a 90 turn that steered them well clear of our ships. With that I moved on and let them be. Of note, we record every interaction we have with foreign vessels through our forward-looking infrared camera. Fast forward two days later I'm browsing the internet, and come across an article on CNN International. The article talks about an unknown helicopter targeting a boat filled with refuges in the Red Sea killing dozens of them. Then there was a picture of the boat filled with bullet holes and dried blood. I looked at the picture and instantly got a sinking feeling in my stomach. The boat looked similar to the one I had orbited several days earlier. I immediately went and pulled the tape from that flight and found the interaction with the boat. My heart sank as I confirmed my fears. The boat in the article was the boat I saw several days earlier. These people were not bothering anyone and were just trying to make a better life for themselves and their children. To this day I do not know what helicopter targeted them. There were many countries operating in that area. I doubt anything came of it besides a quick mention in the news. To me the creepiest thing is how any person can possibly find it in themselves to mercilessly target a boat full of refugees. Fort Carson, during War Horse Strike 2015. It was the last day of a two-week field problem. We were all packed out and ready to go home but couldn't do so until the next day because our good friends in the arty battery lost a pair of sea in the dark flavor MREs. Naturally, we were all out of dip slash smokes slash caffeine and from our location could see our barracks near the helicopter field. One of our I'm retiring this year EA types who was fiending for some nicotine arranged a night patrol. We would do a nighttime tactical movement to gate 20 where we would secure a target of opportunity in the form of his wife slinging a few logs of cutter's choice, some great value addition Red Bulls, and a couple cartons of Pall Malls or something is equally cheap over the gate for us to recover, and be back before sunrise. Off we marched, fueled by addiction and boredom. For those at Carson, I believe it was TA-7, along the road just beyond the north ridge of the impact zone running east-west. Now, this training area was our backyard. We did ruck marches and similar exercises here almost weekly in the night, day and every time in between. We were not sleep deprived as we were just waiting for Artie to screw their lives, and by all means this should have been across the valley and get on the parallel trail kind of op. In the bed of this valley, there is a stream. It was early fall, and it was largely dry. So sound carried and smell was dampened. The night was crystal clear, slim waning crescent of a moon and pretty limited illumination, but hey, we had looky darkies on. The very moment we cross this stream we are hit by the most repugnant smell. Not a skunk, or a wild unwashed animal, but the kind of smell that is only associated with meat gone bad. It's not uncommon to find dead deer and the like out here, but we'd been training in the area all week. There was nothing here the entire time and this is the kind of smell so you wouldn't have missed had you tried. Like, some advanced decomposition. We wanted our drugs. 
so we pushed on writing it off as a dead animal. The forest surrounding the stream was about 200 meters across, only taking us a few minutes to pass through. Myself, being the other NCO in this party was at the rear of the train to make sure nobody got lost in the dark. So, I've been followed before. I hunt and enjoy being alone. When you get that gut feeling that something is watching you, there is no logical explanation. The trees obscured our vision to the rest of the unit, and I was the rear of the party. When I look back there are a pair of gleaming eyes in my night vision no more than 10 meters away. Unfortunate part, we had no live ammo. Although I would not have wanted to explain that to the O-types. Equally unfortunate part we had places to be so we could not investigate. Bet your ass I hurried on out of there and scaled the other side of that valley. We also took the long way home so as to enjoy our spoils in relative privacy. Back in 2012 I was lucky enough to be a private in the army in Afghanistan. I won't bore you with details, but I meddled with the radios on a small team in a pretty remote area on a combat outpost. We conducted 24-hour operations and one night, we get this very weird transmission. It came in pretty strong and we couldn't determine from what direction it was coming in. However, what truly made it odd was what was being said. Now. I'm no linguist but I know enough about different languages to know this wasn't Pashtun or Dari, or even English for that matter, it was straight up Russian. This is when red flags start going up and we begin to make phone calls to our operations center and begin to wake people up. We had a recording device and managed to catch most of the broadcast before it stopped completely. We didn't have any Russian linguists with us. We had no idea what was going on. We sent a copy of the recording over high side to get information translated. I knew one of the warrant officers in my unit was also a Russian linguist back from the Cold War era and had him have a listen as well. He was rusty but got the general gist of the message. It was a distress call asking for help, that their base was being overrun and being attacked. This was even more confusing as there hasn't been a Russian base in AF since their occupation. We schemed a lot over what caused it. He said maybe it was a pre-recorded beacon that may have just randomly gone off after all these years, who knows. The only thing that bothered me with that explanation was that the whole thing didn't sound like a pre-recorded audio. There was an obvious level of distress in their voice. Albeit, there was no background noise to it. Supernaturally. I can only think of what was rumored to be some haunted living quarters at Duke Airfield, an adjacent site to Eglin Air Force Base down in West Florida, and spending some time there on sweet detachment to the Air Force's security during early Iraq War. Was coming out of the bathroom in that living quarters on a break, I don't even say latrine anymore. Wow, it's been a long time, and saw this young woman that just looked like she was tired and disgruntled at something. The look on her face, the way her hair was a little bedraggled, the wrinkles on her clothing. Saw her go left, the same way I was going to head outside. I turned the corner, didn't see her. I went outside, didn't see her. Couldn't have been 10 seconds behind her. Asked my Air Force counterpart in the patroller outside out of curiosity if he'd saw a tired looking female come out before me, and he said no, no one had. Admittedly. We weren't on the clock, we were parked in a living quarters parking lot, so my counterpart probably had his nose in something like his logbook or adjusting the radio to not have seen her. Still, that was one fast mover to leave the outside exit area before I could get eyes on her again. To this day, there's just a little bit of wonder left over that she actually was the ghost and she vanished around the corner. I can't even recall hearing the front door open and close, either. Distance, probably. Realistically creepy, I worked early response to the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Between keeping seagulls off corpses washed up on beaches from capsized casinos, to working with cadaver dog teams, passing by miles of just driveways and cul-de-sac roads where houses and Walmarts used to be, I have too many stories, and often only enough resilience left to talk about one of them in detail every now and then.
I was in the US Navy and worked in communications. I was a supervisor on my watch and enjoyed working the night tours while on deployment. We stood 12 hour watches from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Around 2 a.m. I hear some chatter over the 3MC, which is like our internal speaker system used between a few different stations on the ship. It's the bridge asking combat if they see anything on surface or air radar, maybe 10 miles out to our west. Combat returns with a negative and I don't think anything of it. About 15 minutes goes by and the bridge asks again, and asks are they sure there's nothing there. Then they ask us if we have any message traffic about any ships in the area, aircraft or anomalous weather patterns. I ask one of the guys on watch to perform the request and now my interest is piqued. I walk out of the comm center and head up to the bridge. I was on a frigate so the walk was quick, and I get up there and ask what's going on. One of my buddies points me over to the port side, and we walk over. There's about 5 or 6 circular shaped lights about 10 to 15 miles out in the clouds, pretty large. They aren't moving or flying around but just looking stable. These lights are also casting lights downward on the ocean, and you can see the light refracting back at the water. From what we could see, it didn't appear to be lights shining up from the water because they wouldn't pass through the clouds. The clouds also weren't super thick, it was lightly overcast, and it was the middle of the night with no other light pollution on the water. There was nothing in message traffic about any ships, subs, or aircraft in the area. We were hundreds of miles from land and the last report of any unusual weather patterns was a water spout a few hundred miles away. We tried to take pictures with our onboard digital camera, using a long exposure, but we couldn't capture the phenomenon. After about 90 minutes the light slowly faded and then completely disappeared. I'm sure there's some sort of weather or atmospheric condition for what we saw, but for all intents and purposes, it fit the description of a UFO. Unidentified flying object. A buddy of mine was stationed at Kadena Air Force Base in Okinawa in the aughts. It was a regular day full of standard base activity, indoors and out, when the sirens went off followed by a warning for all staff to report to the base's mess hall. My friend, and everyone else, was quite confused but followed orders. Upon arrival at the hall, they found it was full of the base's staff with a uniformed officer taking role. The base commander settled everyone down and advised them that everyone was just taking a short break, that there was nothing to worry about, and that everyone would be back to work shortly. Everyone sat at the long lunch tables, scratching their heads and discussing what could be up. This particular room in the hall was interior, and had no windows. Once the roll was completed and everyone accounted for, the commander left, and soldiers carrying automatic rifles closed the doors to the hall and stood inside them at attention, essentially barring anyone from leaving. This raised the chatter quite a bit, but nobody panicked. Only a couple of minutes later, an incredibly loud engine sound can be heard approaching the base. As whatever is making the noise lands, it shakes the entire island. Framed photos fall off the wall and trophies in glass cases are shaken over. The engine hum and shaking then ceases. Chatter again rises sharply, as speculation about what the hell's going on increases. After about an hour, the noise starts up, and the island shakes again as whatever it is takes off and quickly fades away. Shortly after, the base commander enters and says everyone can get back to work, warning them not to discuss today's break and to simply forget about it. When I asked him what he thought it was, he immediately suggested that it was some kind of classified skunk works spy plane, maybe the Aurora needing to land for emergency repairs or refueling. Of course, he said, since they kept us all from seeing it, I'll never truly know. So I'm currently stationed on an aircraft carrier commissioned in 77. There is never a lack of creepiness on that thing at night. I work security on it at night, and we rotate from nights to days every so often. I remember one night my buddy was heading up to the flight deck with a rifle from where our armory is, first deck, up to the flight deck, 
Oh, four level, which is a five story difference. It's a lot of distance to travel alone at night. So he gets to a certain part of the boat that's almost pitch black, once pre drawn from the flight deck, and he hears these footsteps behind him. He looks back and no one is there. So he picks up the pace, and as he does, he hears the same footsteps. He looks back and this time he sees a dark figure about 30 feet behind him. At this point his fuck that switch turns on and he starts briskly jogging. He then hears the footsteps also pick up the pace and run after him. He dead sprints up the last flight of stairs up to the flight deck, and hustles over to where we are on the front of the ship. He's white as a ghost and tells us what happens. We stay away from that area of the ship now. Other than that, down on the seventh deck of the ship, second to last deck before you hit the hull, there are munition storage areas, basically where we keep our bombs for planes. Well back in the day a little girl falls down one of the ladder wells, which is legit a six-story drop to the bottom. She ended up dying. There are chains and various other items that can be moved, and they say at night if you're not paying attention, zoning out, she'll come by and rattle the chains hanging from the ceiling and move things. The fantail, which is an area that is outside the ship that looks over the water on the back of the ship, there are multiple ghosts with two lookouts that stand watch out there. One of the ghosts is of a little girl, you'll hear her giggling, then a bouncy ball bouncing on the deck out there, then a splash in the water. There is also a ghost that will come to you as you're nodding off on the watch. He'll be in his dress uniform, he'll tap you on the shoulder and say don't report this then he'll jump into the water. Other than that it's always a constant feeling of being watched at night if you're alone in certain areas. Was in Iraq in 06, my month was up to rotate to the FOB for guard duty. We used it as a break from patrolling the city we were in. The place was called Beharia and it was a massive compound that Saddam's sons used to rape and torture women, supposedly we never actually looked it up. The guard tower was two stories high and you had to use a metal spiral staircase to get up go the second floor. One night about halfway through our post me and my buddy are BSing to pass the time and we hear someone sprinting up the stairs in full gear. It was loud. We quickly grab our helmets and put them on while I flick my cigarette out. We wait. And wait. Slowly I turn around to look at the stairs and grab my surefire and saw. No one is there. I tell my buddy I'm going to go look and make sure the cog isn't lying in wait. I make my way down the stairs to the entrance of the tower and use my surefire to look down the road in front of me and to my right. No one is there. No truck snuck up on us and no gator vehicle was outside. The walls on both sides of the road leading to our tower were 20 feet high and had broken bottles at the top so we know no one climbed over. Tower 5 was also at the corner of a compound that was miles long on each side. I went back upstairs and told him I didn't see anyone. He didn't believe and checked himself. When he came back up his face turned white and we sat and silenced the rest of our shift. We always traded when we could to not go back up there. This is all classified. My buddy was stationed at a base in the Middle East somewhere. The base was surrounded by a wall that had guard posts at various locations around the wall and one or two other locations that soldiers would keep post, including barracks. There was also a big abandoned warehouse on the base that was not being used. It had huge heavy doors that opened outward from the middle, which were always closed. Soldiers had to walk past this warehouse when switching post. Well one night when my buddy was in his barracks, gunshots went off. Everyone rushed to get geared up and figure out what was going on. Once they figured out the gunshots came from inside the base they went to the location of the shots. Two soldiers were posted up, guns pointed to the old warehouse and were freaked out. One of the doors to the warehouse was pushed slightly open. They yelled at the two soldiers to see what was going on, but the guys didn't budge. They said that something big and black was just ran inside that warehouse. Once they calmed the two guys down they did a sweep of the warehouse and found nothing. It took two soldiers to push the door shut again. 
The next night there was screaming coming from inside the warehouse. They did a sweep. Nothing. Next night, more screams. Third night, another group of soldiers shifting locations open fired. They basically had the same story as the first group. They said it was fast and basically moved faster than they could aim and shoot. Again the door was pushed open. Took two guys to close it. After this went on for a while, and the soldiers were found mentally healthy, a bigger investigation was set up. They pointed some special cameras at the entrance to the warehouse, set up some guys outside, and waited for something to happen. Well, one night the door was pushed open on camera, and there was basically a demon that stepped out and started screaming bloody murder. The guards opened fire and the thing sprinted faster than humanly possible back inside the warehouse. Both doors were flung open and the thing just screamed. More soldiers came and did a sweep. Nothing. Around this time the soldiers at the base started to piece a few things together. They had always known that a village near the base has a curfew, and no one stays out of their house past nightfall. So some went to investigate why. And long story short the villagers told them that there was a god of death in the area and they dare not stay out past nightfall. Around the time they learned this, a special team came in with more equipment. Some bigger gunners were sent in, including my buddy with special recording equipment. They dragged the big double doors open and set up inside the warehouse. It was pitch black but they could see with their equipment. They set up so two guys sat facing each other, making a square of four guys total. About four hours went by without anything happening. Then, a guy across from my buddy start making a hand signal. He was signaling that something was behind my friend. The guy to the right of my buddy was dozing off and other soldier across form my buddy was perfectly still. My buddy did a 180 from his chair to a crouched position, giving room for him and the guy across from him to open fire. He said when he turned around he just saw this humanoid demon, around 9 feet tall, piercing eyes, and menacing as possible. When he opened fire the thing was so fast it basically teleported to the side and up the wall until it was on the ceiling. They continued to open fire but the thing was fast and kept appearing behind each of the soldiers, endangering them. Eventually the soldiers got the equipment and abandoned the building. The cameras apparently captured everything. My friend was debriefed and told to never speak of it again and the building was demolished. The villagers related the demon to an old mass grave near the base, which after the events above, was dug up and everyone was given a proper burial. I without a doubt did not recall everything correctly, his version had way more detail. The way my buddy tells this story is so convincing and detailed that it's hard not to believe him, but the story is so incredible that it's very hard to believe at the same time. I wish I could get him to type it out for y'all because it's simply amazing. I was in the Navy from 2001 to 2006, I saw some messed up things but this one took the cake. I was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia and at my squadron our supply officer, Suppo, was this really nice guy, a bit of nerd type, but overall really chill and down to earth always went out of his way to help people and also would give us extra gear if we asked. I'd even been to his house a few times for cookouts and just to hang out. He would take leave a lot though and often leave early on Fridays. Around this same time, 2004 or 2005, the local PD had a crazy investigation on their hands. Suitcases full of human body parts were either washing ashore or being found on the side of the road. Nobody could figure out who was doing it or why. I mention this because a few weeks go by and an all squadron email had gone out saying the sup O's wife had gone missing and if any of us had seen her or heard anything about her whereabouts to report it immediately. Of course, nobody comes forward with any info because nobody knew he was married. I've been to his house and never saw any photos of him with his wife, to me it seemed like a typical bachelor pad. Anyway, a week goes by and police search teams find a body in the woods and it's confirmed to be her. It's all over the news that they found her and when they interview him, he's stone-faced. Like zero emotion at all. 
after a lengthy investigation he confesses to killing her and dumping her body in the woods. He also confessed to putting one of the suitcase of body parts on the road but not any of the others. This shook me up because I felt like I knew the guy pretty well. We joked around a lot at work and just seemed like such a normal guy. Navy Boot Camp, Orlando. I was alone on watch in our company's barracks compartment. I was checking all the windows because the CC liked to unlock one or two to make sure we checked them all. That put me between the racks, bunk beds, and the wall. I caught movement down the middle open area of the compartment, a flash of white. White shoes meant brand new recruit, we had been there longer enough we were wearing our black oxfords. I went between the racks to the middle so I could see who had come into the compartment. The outside door definitely hadn't opened, and I would have heard the door by the inside stairwell. The door to the laundry area was locked. Standing across the open area, by the other row of racks, was a girl with curly dark hair wearing the same female utilities as me, light blue shirt, black pants. She was wearing the white tennis shoes which meant she'd only been there a couple weeks. She looked at me, then she wasn't there. No place for her to go, we were in the middle of the compartment, yards from any door, and nowhere to hide. I didn't see her move, she just wasn't there one moment to the next. Only saw her for a heartbeat or two. Spookier still, years later, our new FN was telling about do roving patrol watch at boot camp, and how they kept finding a pair of white sneakers in the locked laundry room of an empty compartment. Freaked her out. Said the red lights always look darker in there, they'd do their checks and leave as fast as they could. Thought one of the CCs was playing a joke with the shoes. I asked which building, which wing, which floor. Yep, yeah, my old compartment where I had seen the girl. I used to be stationed in Fort Irwin in CA. It's a long story, but there is a 30 mile road that leads from Barstow, the closet town, into the base which is in a large empty desert. There are dozens of crosses along the road leading into the base from soldiers and family of soldiers who have had accidents on this road throughout the years. Anyways, a buddy of mine who was my platoon mate and I were driving back from the mall in Virtovo one night. As we entered the starting stretch of Fort Iren Road I noticed some fresh bloody tire marks leading off the side of the road directly into a cross which was dated something like August 11, 1989, this date was like August 11, 2006. Really creeped me out and I thought I was seeing things. About 20 minutes into our long drive down this isolated two-lane highway leading into the vast empty desert, I look over to my buddy who was driving and lip-syncing to some song. And then as we were going about 75 miles per hour, something darted out in front of us. I quickly caught a glimpse of what looked like a large humanoid beast with fur and a wet hairy face. It looked directly at us even though we were going 75 miles per hour and it was running right across his car. The thing was tall. At least 7 foot. Walking on two legs. But the eyes. The eyes were like. I don't know how to explain it, but for that split second when it turned to look at us. As it turned its body and I looked into its eyes it was like time slowed down and its eyes were white voids. Not a reflection really. More like dead light, Stephen King reference. And it wasn't a look of fear. But it was a look of I see you hello. It was the most skin crawling thing I have ever experienced. Whatever that was it was not human, not animal. It was sentient, but not. Not like we are. I won't say it had powers but whatever it did to us when we looked at it. I don't know. I turned to my friend who yelled out holy s, and then the thing. It ran off to the other side of the highway. My buddy thought that we almost hit someone, so we stopped and got out to check, but whatever it was ran off into the empty desert night. And then he began to repeat large. Harry. Bird? No. No not bird. Bear. Bear. No. What? What was that? It took us about another 20 minutes to get to base and we just sat there, music off. Not talking to each other. He was quiet, 
which he was never quiet, not Brian. I tried to think of what to say, but we were too chill to really talk. Once we got back to base and told our squad members about what had happened, but no one believed us. That is until a few weeks passed by and I started hearing quiet murmurs from people who didn't want to speak openly, but they said that they too saw similar sightings. Years later, after I got out of the service, I did some research online and learned about native folklore passed down by indigenous Native Americans who claimed that Sasquatch was believed to live out in the barren salt flats. Google pulled up a lot of interesting information. Whatever it was. My friend turned white as a ghost that night and we never spoke of it to each other again. I was a corpsman stationed in Okinawa between 2014 to 2016. There are a lot and a lot of stories about Oki being haunted. I heard a lot of Marines tell me about episodes of sleep paralysis where they'd wake up at night unable to move with dark figures standing over them or more often women. Camp Hansen was particularly haunted or so Thule say. I worked ambulance services there and there was a particular barracks building. I can't remember the number that received quite a few calls while I was there of possession type incidents where Marines would suddenly become extremely violent and begin screaming about demons to the point where it would take about 10 people to hold them down. I personally responded to one such incident. A Marine was just drinking beer down by the quarter deck. A well-known Marine with no prior history of mental illness or incidents, a pretty straight shooter, suddenly became delirious at the drop of a hat. He went from chatting normally to smashing his face against the stairs, screaming make it stop. I arrived on scene and he was being held down by at least 8 or 9 people. He was thrashing wildly and contorting like something out of the exorcist. trying to smash his head back against the floor all the while repeating make it stop i did my job and got him to the er i can't say for certain whether it was supernatural as there was a big drug problem at the time as well spice cough syrup otc things you find in japan and i do believe he tested positive for rhabdomyolysis which can cause confusion but this was really really acute like at the drop of a hat not gradual in the slightest. Okay, this is a story a friend a former colleague from the German army, the Bundeswehr, told me on one night after a patrol shift when we got drunk, and it still creeps me out cuz he's one of the most reasonable and down-to-earth guys I've ever met. Just some context for the international readers. The German Bundeswehr is part of the Kfir, the Kosovo force. a peacekeeping force that entered duty in 1999. One of the stations of the German forces was the so-called Prizren airfield. My colleague, back when he was a under officer, was stationed there several times. On his last time, just 2 or 3 weeks before his flight back to Germany, he was on his way back from a delivery tour with a younger guy that just arrived in Prizren. So they drove with a Wolf, a Bundeswehr Mercedes-Benz G. when they saw a bright light that was glowing behind a small hill that was pretty unusual because they were right in the nowhere surrounded by patches of a forest between Prizren and Dojnes the thought i could be a plane crash a camp of bandits or something but they didn't know so they stopped and started climbing the small hill when they heard a strange noise that sounded like the noise of a transformer at a substation after they reached the top there was no plane crash but They did see some kind of craft that was landed between the trees. My colleague described it as a upside down a bowl made out of silver or another shiny metal with three or four tiny legs that was he did not how to describe that glowing from the inside. Right behind the craft they saw some people or better humanoid creatures in tight suits that were walking around like they were searching for something. One of them held a device in his long hands that looked like a metal rod with a glowing light on its top that started flashing after some time. Then one of the other beings knelt down and maybe took a sample of some plant or something. Right after that, all that happened in in maybe one or two minutes, they boarded their craft through some hatch or door. Then the craft that started hovering over the ground. After that, My colleague said that they started feeling strange and ill and just fell asleep. 
They woke up an half hour later laying on the ground and staring at the sky. The two thought they were crazy and could not be live what they saw. They walked down where they saw the craft and the beings and found some marks of the legs on the ground but nothing more. Of course, they did not report this event cause everybody would think they were crazy. I'll tell you a story that I heard from my father, now deceased. He was a career Air Force Air Traffic Controller, Trakin, Rupkan, all that. Made Chief Master Sergeant, 24 years served. He was a no BS kind of guy, hard but fair, and I never in all my life knew him to exaggerate a story, or weave a tall tale. We were on a trip together a few years after he retired, and I had Coast to Coast AM on, Crazy Paranormal Alien, radio program. He tells me that while on duty at either March AFB or Edwards, can't remember which as this was a while ago, he had something crazy fast on the scopes doing all kinds of things that shouldn't be physically possible, that they cross verified with other units as not being equipment failure or an anomaly. Next day some LTC they didn't know rounds everybody who was on shift, the CCTLR and OIC and pretty much tells them that nothing happened, they didn't see anything and to forget it if they valued their careers. As a side note, he was involved with the testing of the SR-71, stealth fighter, and both stealth bombers. He spoke about that at length when the aircraft were declassified, and even brought me some models that the Lockheed and Northrop Grumman guys used to give out to the airmen as promotional items I guess. He was pretty clear in telling me that this was not that. He said that he was pretty sure that it was a UFO or something. I don't know what to believe about it, and I'm not really into that subculture, but I know my dad, and he was clearly at a loss to explain that night. United States Marine Corps, I was an infantry machine gunner. My first tour in Iraq back in 05, my unit was stationed at a dam in Haditha, 10 stories high and 10 stories below, we occupied all of the above ground levels as living quarters and offices and only two levels below, the minus two was for interrogations. Anyways we had heard that beyond the second sublevel there were chilling sites and that this place was a known area where Saddam would torture people. One night me and two of my friends say damn, let's just see what the minus three level has, from there we'd judge if we would go further down. We spotted a bloody handprint that dragged across the wall, someone's shoe left behind, and a whole lot of mess, it was kinda creepy but not too bad, I wasn't scared, yet. So we walk down the hall and decide hey let's climb this ladder, go into this room and have a smoke. At this point it's about 1am, the only other marines awake should be those on guard at their posts and no one should be anywhere near us, or looking for us. Well while we were smoking and joking someone coughs out loud but it wasn't either of us, we got real quite thought maybe it had been some officer or SNCO, that could hear us or smell the smoke, and was trying to catch in an unauthorized area, so we waited silently. One of us did a recon on the hallway we came from no one was there. At that point we were like yup let's get out of here, climbed back down the ladder and walked out the back way to make sure there wasn't anyone else playing a joke on us. Well, it was just us three on the third sublevel. Earlier that deployment I had told some of my other friends we should try to venture to the last sublevel, but after this incident I never went back to the sublevels, I don't think my friends did either. Went to Iraq thinking IEDs were the scariest thing I was going to encounter, nope. It's a long story, but there is a 30 mile road that leads from Barstow, the closet town, into the base which is in a large empty desert. There are dozens of crosses along the road leading into the base from soldiers and family of soldiers who have had accidents on this road throughout the years. Anyways, a buddy of mine who was my platoon mate and I were driving back from the mall in Virtoval one night. As we entered the starting stretch of Fort Irwin Road I noticed some fresh bloody tire marks leading off the side of the road directly into a cross, which was dated something like, August 11, 1989, this date was like August 11, 2006. Really creeped me out and I thought I was seeing things. 
About 20 minutes into our long drive down this isolated two-lane highway leading into the vast empty desert, I look over to my buddy who was driving and lip-syncing to some song. And then as we were going about 75 miles per hour, something darted out in front of us. I quickly caught a glimpse of what looked like a large humanoid beast with fur and a wet hairy face. It looked directly at us even though we were going 75 miles per hour and it was running right across his car. The thing was tall, at least 7 foot, walking on two legs. But the eyes, the eyes were like, I don't know how to explain it, but for that split second when it turned to look at us, as it turned its body and I looked into its eyes it was like time slowed down and its eyes were white voids. Not a reflection really, more like dead light, Stephen King reference. And it wasn't a look of fear, but it was a look of I see you hello. It was the most skin crawling thing I have ever experienced. Whatever that was it was not human, not animal. It was sentient, but not, not like we are. I won't say it had powers but whatever it did to us when we looked at it, I don't know. I turned to my friend who yelled out holy s. Yes. And then the thing, it ran off to the other side of the highway. My buddy thought that we almost hit someone, so we stopped and got out to check, but whatever it was ran off into the empty desert night. And then he began to repeat large hairy bird? No, no not bird. Bear. Bear. No, what? What was that? It took us about another 20 minutes to get to base and we just sat there, music off, not talking to each other. He was quiet, which he was never quiet, not Brian. I tried to think of what to say, but we were too chill to really talk. Once we got back to base and told our squad members about what had happened, but no one believed us. That is until a few weeks passed by and I started hearing quiet murmurs from people who didn't want to speak openly, but they said that they too saw similar sightings. Years later, after I got out of the service, I did some research online and learned about native folklore passed down by indigenous Native Americans who claimed that Sasquatch was believed to live out in the barren salt flats. Google pulled up a lot of interesting information. Whatever it was, my friend turned white as a ghost that night and we never spoke of it to each other again. Navy Boot Camp, Orlando I was alone on watch in our company's barracks compartment. I was checking all the windows because the CC liked to unlock one or two to make sure we checked them all. That put me between the racks, bunk beds, and the wall. I caught movement down the middle open area of the compartment, a flash of white. White shoes meant brand new recruit, we had been there longer enough we were wearing our black oxfords. I went between the racks to the middle so I could see who had come into the compartment. The outside door definitely hadn't opened, and I would have heard the door by the inside stairwell. The door to the laundry area was locked. Standing across the open area, by the other row of racks, was a girl with curly dark hair wearing the same female utilities as me, light blue shirt, black pants. She was wearing the white tennis shoes which meant she'd only been there a couple weeks. She looked at me, then she wasn't there. No place for her to go, we were in the middle of the compartment, yards from any door, and nowhere to hide. I didn't see her move, she just wasn't there one moment to the next. Only saw her for a heartbeat or two. Spookier still, Years later, our new FN was telling about do roving patrol watch at boot camp, and how they kept finding a pair of white sneakers in the locked laundry room of an empty compartment. Freaked her out. Said the red lights always looked darker in there, they do their checks and leave as fast as they could. Thought one of the CCs was playing a joke with the shoes. I asked which building, which wing, which floor. Yep, my old compartment where I had seen the girl. I got to my first unit in the army after basic combat training in 8. A buddy from basic got there at the same time and we were put in the same room. The building was about 3 years old, so it was modern, with two bedroom, shared kitchen on the left and bathroom to the right. My room, back and to the left, homie's room back and to the right. His door had this official US army crime scene tape around the edges. Being curious fresh privates, we asked the senior specialists what it was about to which they would just skirt around any kind of answer. Fast forward a few months, 
homie moved to his platoon's hallway, and my Navajo buddy from basic moved in. By this point the crime scene tape was removed. He's a traditional Navajo, fairly spiritual type, and starts telling me he getting odd feelings from the room. I tell him I'm kinda creeped out by it because of the tape, but I'm not terribly worried about it. Fast forward again, probably about a year in the same room. Homie is at an early morning appointment as I wake up to do my pre-PT grooming. His door is slightly cracked, which is unusual for him. His toothbrush is left by the bathroom sink when he usually keeps it in his room. I don't think anything of it. He must have been in a rush. I did him the solid of putting his toothbrush where it usually sits in his room and leave the door in the same position as I found it, about an inch open. I go back to the mirror to start my shave when, in the reflection, I see his door slam open, slam closed, slam open, and finally crack about an inch where it started. I immediately left for PT and took the ass chewing for not shaving. United States Marine Corps, I was an infantry machine gunner. My first tour in Iraq back in 05, my unit was stationed at a dam in Haditha, 10 stories high and 10 stories below, we occupied all of the above ground levels as living quarters and offices and only two levels below, the minus two was for interrogations. Anyways we had heard that beyond the second sublevel there were chilling sites and that this place was a known area where Saddam would torture people. One night me and two of my friends say F it, let's just see what the minus three level has, from there we'd judge if we would go further down, we spotted a bloody handprint that dragged across the wall, someone's shoe left behind, and a whole lot of mess, it was kinda creepy but not too bad, I wasn't scared, yet. So we walk down the hall and decide hey let's climb this ladder, go into this room and have a smoke. At this point it's about 1am, the only other marines awake should be those on guard at their posts and no one should be anywhere near us, or looking for us. Well while we were smoking and joking someone coughs out loud but it wasn't either of us, we got real quite thought maybe it had been some officer or SNCO, that could hear us or smell the smoke, and was trying to catch in an unauthorized area, so we waited silently. One of us did a recon on the hallway we came from no one was there. At that point we were like yup, let's get out of here climbed back down the ladder and walked out the back way to make sure there wasn't anyone else playing a joke on us. Well, it was just us three on the third sublevel. Earlier that deployment I had told some of my other friends we should try to venture to the last sublevel, but after this incident I never went back to the sublevels, I don't think my friends did either. Went to Iraq thinking IEDs were the scariest thing I was going to encounter, nope. My friend was in the US Army and Korea stationed right on the DMZ but in the middle of nowhere. Across the small valley on the NK side was a propaganda village where nobody lives but is made up to look like a nice place. They had these loudspeakers that would go all day with propaganda directed toward the South Koreans talking about how they would be squashed by the North if they attacked, etc. His birthday was on a nice mild night in late summer. While sitting outside enjoying the quiet darkness, Smoking a cigarette and stargazing the loudspeakers in the NK village start blaring, in English, Happy Birthday, Private Joseph Michael Smith, Social Security Number X. Your mother, Nancy, and your father, Robert, miss you dearly and anxiously await your safe return home. My friend was sufficiently freaked the hell out after that. He did stay at the location for the rest of his tour but nobody ever found out exactly how his personal information got leaked. I was a corpsman stationed in Okinawa, between 2014 to 2016. There are a lot and a lot of stories about Oki being haunted. I heard a lot of Marines tell me about episodes of sleep paralysis, where they'd wake up at night unable to move, with dark figures standing over them, or more often women. Camp Hansen was particularly haunted, or so the story goes. I worked ambulance services there, and there was a particular barracks building, I can't remember the number, that received quite a few calls while I was there of possession type incidents, where marines would suddenly become extremely violent and begin screaming about demons to the point where it would take about 10 people to hold them down. I personally responded to one such incident. 
A Marine was just drinking beer down by the quarterdeck, a well-known Marine with no prior history of mental illness or incidents, a pretty straight shooter, suddenly became delirious at the drop of a hat. He went from chatting normally to smashing his face against the stairs, screaming make it stop. I arrived on scene and he was being held down by at least eight or nine people. He was thrashing wildly and contorting like something out of the exorcist, trying to smash his head back against the floor. All the while repeating make it stop. I did my job and got him to the ER. I can't say for certain whether it was supernatural, as there was a big drug problem at the time as well, spice, cough syrup, stuff you find in Japan, and I do believe he tested positive for rhabdomyolysis, which can cause confusion. But this was really, really acute. Like at the drop of a hat, not gradual in the slightest. Okay, this is a story a friend a former colleague from the German army, the Bundeswehr, told me on one night after a patrol shift when we got drunk, and it still creeps me out cause he's one of the most reasonable and down-to-earth guys I've ever met. Just some context for the international readers. The German Bundeswehr is part of the Kfir, the Kosovo force, a peacekeeping force that entered duty in 1999. One of the stations of the German forces was the so-called Prizren airfield. My colleague, back when he was a Unteroffizier, was stationed there several times. On his last time, just two or three weeks before his flight back to Germany, he was on his way back from a delivery tour with a younger guy that just arrived in Prizren. So they drove with a Wolf, a Bundeswehr Mercedes-Benz G, when they saw bright light that was glowing behind a small hill. That was pretty unusual because they were right in the nowhere surrounded by patches of a forest between Prizren and Dojnes. The thought I could be a plane crash, a camp of bandits or something but they didn't know. So they stopped and started climbing the small hill when they heard a strange noise that sounded like the noise of a transformer at a substation. After they reached the top there was no plane crash but, they did see some kind of craft that was landed between the trees. My colleague described it as a upside down a bowl made out of silver or another shiny metal with three or four tiny legs that was, he did not how to describe that, glowing from the inside. Right behind the craft they some some people, or better, humanoid creatures in tight suits that were walking around like they were searching for something. One of them held a device in his long hands that looked like a metal rod with a glowing light on its top, that started flashing after some time. Then one of the other beings knelt down and maybe took a sample of some plant or something. Right after that, all that happened in in maybe one or two minutes, they boarded their craft through some hatch or door. Then the craft that started hoovering over the ground. After that, my colleague said that they started feeling strange and ill and just fell asleep. They woke up an half hour later laying on the ground and staring at the sky. The two thought they were crazy and could not be live what they saw. They walked down where they saw the craft and the beings and found some marks of the legs on the ground but nothing more. Of course, they did not report this event cause everybody would think they were crazy. I was in the Navy as a hospital corpsman. My last duty station was Charleston, SC, Navy Hospital. I think it was on a weekend because my XH had our kids for the day and my BF and I had gone to see the movie Identity which was new in theaters. If you haven't seen it, it's about some people who get stuck at a roadside motel in some bad weather. There's more to it than that, trust me, but it was enough to give me a bad case of the heebie-jeebies. That night, I had overnight duty at the hospital. Now the hospital was in its final years of service and was mostly abandoned. The very top floor, 10th, I think was the operating room, the second floor was the administrative, CO suite, and the first floor was just clinics. There was no inpatient service there and absolutely nothing on the other floors. I was on duty, I think from 7 pm to 7 am with one other person and we were the only two people in this huge, abandoned hospital just a couple hours after one of us watched a scary movie. Every hour, on the hour, I had to make rounds which was taking a flashlight in the elevator, and walking around each floor, making sure it was empty, nothing was on, nothing was dripping, etc. and then moving on to the next floor. I did the 10th floor. 
It was fine. Ninth floor, got out of the elevator, listened for a minute, and then got back in. Somewhere around the seventh floor, something scared me. I don't remember what it was. Probably a mouse. I still had to do the rounds but I was so freaked out and panicked, and I had a radio to radio my colleague, but he wasn't answering. Which just added to the creepiness factor. So by the time Six showed up on the elevator, I just opened the elevator door, made sure there was no mass murderer standing there. Good, on to five. That was the quickest finished rounds I'd ever done and still would not wish that on anyone. The hospital is, was, still standing last I checked, but is no longer in use. My colleague found it howlingly funny that I was so freaked out walking around an abandoned hospital at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Oh, and there was a back door that was known to anyone who worked there that was always open and unlocked 24-7. Anyone could have totally come and gone and not been noticed by the duty watch because they put the duty crew on the wrong side of the building. I don't know if paranormal, but it for sure falls under creepy. It was 1999, I was an 18 year old fresh out of 8 and moved to Fort Carson as my first duty assignment, got my barracks room, assigned to second platoon, and everything in my army life was moving great. It comes to Friday and we have our safety brief and one of the senior E4s tell me after formation to come over to his room for some after work drinks. I was 18 so it was not allowed but who cares people are getting to know me, I can have a beer and it won't be an issue, the army is great. So I go get in my coolest lucky jeans, and button up short sleeve shirt, god I was lame, and walked over and knocked on his door. What I was greeted by was the creepiest thing I have ever seen. Nine members of my platoon were watching porn, and all still in uniform. Just sitting there drinking, watching porn together. No one was naked or doing anything weird, just nine grown-ass men in uniform still watching porn. They passed me a beer and asked if I could join. I told them hey, I'm underage I'm going to have to pass they told everyone I was lame but I will never forget the look of lust in their eyes watching that movie, and I have no idea what happened after I left nor did I never bring it up again. This took place on Fort Carson Army Base, Colorado Springs, Colorado in the summer of 2011. I'm a civilian so not accustomed to the military life, but I have an odd occurrence from being a contractor on nearby military bases. This was strange but not as mysterious as most of the top stories. So I'm working on an Army base with two other individuals, doing invasive weed surveys at known locations where specific invasive species have been mapped in Archgis for several years. The area we were at was a small grassy field next to the parking lot of a veterinarian clinic on post. The three of us are doing our vegetation surveys for a couple hours in the afternoon. We are all staring at the ground counting plants and identifying each species. We are in between a road and the parking lot so we see traffic coming and going. At about 330 the veterinarian clinic closes and there are only two or three vehicles in the parking lot. We assume the employee are just finishing closing up, and sure enough we see two ladies come out the front door and then leave in their vehicles. So the only vehicle is our own work truck. As we are slowly making it through this arduous task of cataloging invasive weeds, specifically at this site field bindweed was the nuisance, an SUV drives into the parking lot and then backs up into a parking spot near the end of the building. One guy in army fatigues jumps out and runs up to the building to open the door and prop it open. The other guy gets out and opens the cargo area on the SUV. Then the two men in fatigues pull another guy, who appears to be unconscious, out the back of the vehicle and carry him onto the building. We couldn't see into the back of the vehicle due to being on the other side of the parking lot. All three of us saw this and look at each other like WTF did we just see? About 10 minutes later another vehicle comes into the parking lot, it's a Toyota Prius so we assume it is the personal vehicle of whomever is driving, and this guy in civilian clothing gets out and walks up to the side entrance that the other two men carried their unconscious comrade through. We were perplexed and trying to understand what we just saw. We had no idea what could have been going on. Just a note to any readers, there was a huge hospital on the base and it was less than a one quarter mile away from our location, 
so we really could not understand why an unconscious man would be taken in through a side door of a veterinarian clinic, after hours, by two other men. I'll tell you a story that I heard from my father, now deceased. He was a career Air Force Air Traffic Controller, Traken, Ripcon, all that stuff, made Chief Master Sergeant, 24 years served. He was a no BS kind of guy, hard but fair, and I never in all my life knew him to exaggerate a story, or weave a tall tale. We were on a trip together a few years after he retired, and I had Coast to Coast AM on, Crazy Paranormal Alien, radio program. He tells me that while on duty at either March AFB or Edwards, can't remember which as this was a while ago, he had something crazy fast on the scopes doing all kinds of things that shouldn't be physically possible, that they cross-verified with other units as not being equipment failure or an anomaly. Next day some LTC they didn't know rounds everybody who was on shift, the CCTLR and OIC and pretty much tells them that nothing happened. They didn't see anything and to forget it if they valued their careers. As a side note, he was involved with the testing of the SR-71, stealth fighter, and both stealth bombers. He spoke about that at length when the aircraft were declassified, and even brought me some models that the Lockheed and Northrop Grumman guys used to give out to the airmen as promotional items I guess. He was pretty clear in telling me that this was not that. He said that he was pretty sure that it was a UFO or something. I don't know what to believe about it, and I'm not really into that subculture, but I know my dad, and he was clearly at a loss to explain that night. Not me but a friend on Nas Whidbey Island, Washington, just north of Seattle, non-paranormal but weird. He worked for one of the squadrons. I don't recall which. He was pulling over night rover duty. So he is doing his checks and he comes across an opening in the floor. It must have been covered with something before as he had no recollection of it. So he goes down inside. He's in a long tunnel going as far as he can see. Stacked on either side are filing cabinets. He opens one to find files going back to the 60s. He starts to walk down to see how far the tunnel goes but gets kinda creeped out in the I'm not supposed to be here way. So he goes back to post and tells his watchmate. They call it in and whomever his watchmate talked to said mark it down, and don't go back. Next night he's on watch again. The passage is still open. Goes down. It's cleared out. Nothing in there at all. A day later the opening is shut and paved over. He gets pulled aside that day and told never talk about what you saw. I have a story from my NCO in infantry training school for the Marine Corps. So my sergeant was at a checkpoint in Iraq at train station and a solo Marine with a saw comes walking towards them, full gear as well. They know he's a Marine, so they tell him to stop and give them this number that you get when you're deployed, sorry, I can't remember what it's called, so he gives them his number and he moves forward to them. When he gets to them I guess they are just talking about the war and shooting the stuff when he says gotta get back to my guys and walks away. Finding that extremely strange that a marine would be solo like that in a war zone they look up the number they gave him. The guy was deployed the cycle before them and not only that, but it showed he got killed in action. He said it was creepy and it happened to other marines there too. My sergeant said weird stuff happens in war. I heard this story in 2012 and I'll always remember it because the way he told it, some of our NCOs rightfully messed with us but I know this sergeant was telling the truth. I was fortunate to serve on the 2010 deployment for this fine war vessel since my ship was still being built down in Mississippi. As part of being an engineering department it is basically drilled into your head of what happened on the ship and the people who fought to keep the boat from sinking. For me the creepiest things I got about to seeing was misplaced items I've set down and sometime later the item would be in a different location. This was inside main engine room 1. Where two engine men basically died instantly from the blast. Granted this all happened late at night so I don't know if it was them and or the combo of being sleepy. All I do know is that ship gives me the creeps but regardless I would serve on board again.
My grandpa was in the Navy in the Vietnam era. He and his crew were in Panama for a brief stay, and he was told to guard a pier with another man to look out for guerrillas. He was given a gun that wasn't loaded, because if he shot someone that was attacking him he could cause an international conflict. So he and this other man started from the middle of the pier and walked in opposite directions and would meet back in the middle every 10 minutes or so. My grandpa was on the half of the pier that went further into the water, while the other man would go to the beginning of the pier that connected to the shore and nearly went into the jungle where gorillas were known to frequent. It was about 30 minutes before the end of his duty, when my grandpa arrived to the middle of the pier alone. He waited for a few minutes but the other man didn't show to meet him there. My grandpa walks to the end of the pier and back twice, manning his post. The other guy never meets him in the middle again and when the two other men show up to relieve them, they said they didn't see the other guard either. My grandpa later found out that the man had fallen asleep while walking the pier and fell into the water. He was found alive and put in the brig. My grandpa never saw him again.